Goosebumps in the title, so you know what's coming. That's right, it's Return of the Mummy. Ooh, it says Return, despite the fact we've never actually read a mummy book on here. But hey, I beat the Mummy Demaster on this channel last week, so timing. Initially, I was going to do 
please don't feed the vampire. And then I realised it's not a proper Goosebumps book. It's a choose your own adventure thing, so it wouldn't really work. Oh well. Well, I guess there's no time like the present, is there? So, let's jump right in. With Goosebumps, Return of the Mummy. By R. Elstein. Or R. L. Stein, as I believe his name is really pronounced. Okie dokie, are we excited, chat? I know I am. Uh, my throat isn't. My throat's dreading this by the end of it. But hey, that's life. Okie dokie. Let's start how most books start. With chapter one. Ooh, I know, Maverick, eh? <clears throat> chapter one. Gabe, we'll be landing soon, the stewardess told me, leaning over a seat. Will someone be meeting you at the airport? Yes. Probably an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, I told her. Or maybe a disgusting, decaying mummy. Well, that's freak the stewardess out already, isn't it? She narrowed her eyes at me. No, really, she insisted. Who will be meeting you in Cairo? My Uncle Ben, I replied. Uncle Ben? What the fuck is this Spider-Man? Ooh, this has gone up in my opinion if it is. Ooh. The mummy returns, no way home. Nice. Uh, my uncle Ben, I replied, but if he play, but he likes to play practical jokes. Sometimes he dresses in weird costumes and tries to scare me. You told me that your uncle was a famous scientist. The stewardess says, "Queen, buzz, buzz, hello. How are you doing?" He is, I replied, but it's also weird. She laughed. Ah! I liked her a lot. She had pretty blonde hair. Oh, you talking about stewardess? So, and I liked the way she always tilted her head to one side when she talked. Her name was Nancy, and she always been very nice to... Oh, Christ. <laughs> Her name was Nancy, and she had been very nice to me during the long flight to Egypt. She knew it was my first time flying all by myself, without a plane. Frankly, it was a miraculous I can do that. You should write about a book about it. You should write about a book about it. Yes, that's the phrase. She kept checking on me and asking how I was doing, but she treated me like a grown-up. She didn't bring me one of those stupid join the dots books or a plastic wings badge that they always give to kids on planes. But shit. Demand a badge and a plastic join the dots. She doesn't like you. That's what she's suggesting. Oh no. And she kept slipping me extra bags of peanuts, even though she wasn't supposed to. Oh, well, you're in there, son. Why are you visiting your uncle? Nancy asked. Just for fun? I nodded. I did last summer too, I told her. It was really awesome, but this year, Uncle Ben had been digging in an unexplored pyramid. God, no wonder he keeps dying. He's discovered an ancient sacred tomb, and he invited me to be with him when he opens it up. Ooh. She laughed and tilted her head a little more. <coughs> you haven't got an imagination, Gabe, she said. Then she turned away to answer a man's question. I do have a good imagination, but I wasn't making that up. My uncle Ben Hassad is a famous archaeologist. He has been digging around in pyramids for lots of years. Really, he needs to find a better job. He's, he's, he's been off his meds for some time. I've seen newspaper articles about him. And once he was in National Geographic. In the, um, in the wanted ads. Last summer, my entire family visited Cairo. My cousin Sari and I, she's Uncle Ben's daughter, and some amazing adventures in the chambers of a great pyramid. So I found fat when I used to regularly fly alone as a kid. We had these lanyards with you and them standing for unaccepted minor, but it always sounded like we were just inserting. I didn't know you used to do that a lot. That's pretty cool. That is a fun fact. I have a point. Sorry, we were there this summer too. I remember staring out of the plane window at the solid blue sky. Hey, Mr. Blue Sky. I wondered if maybe she would give me a break this time. I like Sorry, but she's so competitive. She always has to be the first. The strongest, the smartest, the best. She's the only 13-year-old girl I know who can turn eating breakfast into a content. I don't know any 13-year-olds, so I can't say anything. Flight attendants, prepare for landing, the pilot announced over a loudspeaker. I sat up to get a better view out of the window. As the plane lowered, I could see the city of Cairo beneath us. A slender, blue ribbon curled along the city. That I knew was the River Nile. Was the Nile River, not the River Nile. It's going to confuse me, book. Thanks. Make me look like an idiot on the online. On the online. <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> city st- oh, come on, the city stretched out from the river, peering straight down. I could see tall glass skyscrapers and low domed temples. 
where the city ended, the desert began. Yellow sand stretched to the horizon. My stomach began to feel a little fluttery. The pyramids were somewhere out in that desert, and in a day or two, I would be climbing down into one of them, following my uncle into a tomb that hadn't been opened for thousands of years. What would we find? Dead bodies, I'm presuming. I pulled the little mummy hand from my shirt pocket and gazed down at it. It was so tiny, no bigger than a child's hand. I had bought it from a kid at a garage sale for two dollars. He said it was called a summoner. He said it could summon ancient evil spirits. Mm. I'm sensing deus ex mummy fist. It looked like a mummy's hand. The fingers were wrapped in stained gauze bandages with a little black tar showing through. I thought it was a fake made of rubber or plastic. I mean, I never thought it was a real mummy hand. Side note, did you have a good birthday? I did. I did, thank you. It was amazing. Um, I went out uh, just after work to the Bowling Green. Just had a sly meal for a couple of hours. Met up with some close friends. Uh, Daylight Minis was there. So that was nice. And uh, Dan from the podcast. A few other personal close friends. It was amazing. And several of them were a complete surprise. I didn't know they were coming. So, uh, yeah, I had a really great time. So probably one of the best birthdays I've ever had, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, and it wasn't, and my birthday wasn't fake or made of rubber or plastic, nor was it a mummy hand. Uh, but last summer, the hand had saved all of our lives. The kid who sold it to me was right. It really did bring a bunch of mummies to life. It was amazing. I'm guessing there's a prequel to this book I have not read. Of course, my parents and my friends back home didn't believe my incredible story. And they didn't believe that the summoner really worked. They said it was just a joke of mummy in hand made in some souvenir factory. Probably made in Taiwan. But I carried it with me everywhere I go. And it is my good luck charm. I'm not very superstitious, I mean. I walk under ladders all the time. And my lucky number is 13. Oh, you dead of all you. But I really do believe that the little mummy hand will protect me. The strange thing about the mummy hand is that it's always warm. It doesn't feel like plastic. It feels warm, like a real human hand. That's had its hands shoved down someone's pants. Back home in Michigan, I had a major panic attack when mum and dad were packing my suitcase for the flight. I couldn't find the mummy hand. And of course, there was no way I would go to Egypt without it. I was so relieved when I finally found it. It was tucked into the back pocket of a crumpled up pair of jeans. What did I just say about sticking his hand down there? <sighs> now, as the plane nose down for a landing, I reached for the hand in the pocket of my t-shirt. I pulled it out and gasped. The hand was cold. Cold as ice. It was willing to sacrifice. Chapter 2 Why had the mummy hand suddenly turned cold? Was it some kind of a message? A warning? Was I heading into danger? <laughs> Is that terrified or excited? I'll never know. Or care. I didn't have time to think about it. The plane rolled into the gate and the passengers were scrambling to pull down their hand luggage and push their way out of the plane. I took the mummy hand into my jeans pocket, hoisted it up my backpack, and headed to the front. I said goodbye to Nancy. Bye, Nancy. And thanked her for all the peanuts. <laughs> then I followed the others down the long, covered ramp and into the airport. So many people. Bastards. And they all seemed to be in a hurry. They were practically stepping over each other. Many dark business suits, women in loose flowing robes, their faces covered by veils. Teenage girls in jeans and t-shirts, a group of dark, serious-looking men in silky white suits that looked like pyjamas. A family with three little kids, all crying. I had sudden sinking feeling. How would I ever find Uncle Ben in this crowd? My backpack began to feel very heavy. My eyes frantically searched back and forth. Strange voices surrounded me, all talking so loudly, no one was speaking English. Just like this channel, though. Ow, I cried out as I felt a sharp pain in my side. I turned and realised that a woman had bumped me with her luggage cart. Stay calm, Gabe, I interested myself. Just stay calm. Stay calm and everything will be fine. Everything will be fine, guys. Just stay calm. <clears throat> but what if my uncle forgot? I asked myself. What if he mixed up about what day I was arriving? Or what if he got busy down in the pyramid and lost track of time? I can be a weary worrier if I put my mind about it. Well, don't worry about worrying. You'll be fine. And right now, I was worrying enough for three people. If Uncle Ben isn't there, I'll go to a phone and call him, I decided. For sure. I could just hear my saying, Operator, can I speak to my uncle at the pyramids, please? 
And I go, no, the pyramids don't have a line line, you stupid bastard. I don't think that would work too well. I didn't have a phone number for Uncle Ben. I doubt it'll get much reception down the sarcophagus either. I wasn't sure he'd even had a phone out where I was staying. All I know is that he'd been living in a tent somewhere near the pyramid where he was digging. Gazing frantically around the crowd up here, arrival area, I was just about to give in to total panic when a large man came walking up to me. That was the last thing he saw or heard. The end. Oh, wait. I couldn't see his face. He wore a long white hooded robe. It's called a banous, and his face was buried inside the hood. Taxi, he said in a high, shrill voice. Taxi, American taxi. I burst out laughing. Uncle Ben, I cried happily. Taxi, American taxi, taxi ride, he insisted. Uncle Ben, I'm so glad to see you, I exclaimed. I threw my arms around his waist and gave him a big hug. Then, laughing at his stupid disguise, I reached up and pulled back his hood. The man under the hood had a bold, shaved head and a heavy black moustache. He glared at me furiously. I had never seen him before in my life. You didn't see that coming in. Chapter 3 Gabe! Gabe! Over here! I heard a voice calling my name, glancing past the angry man who was wielding a machete. Ooh, uh. I saw Uncle Ben and Sari. They were waving at me from in front of the reservations counter. Ah. The man's face turned bright red and he shouted something at me in Arabic. I was glad I couldn't understand him, apart from the phrase, American taxi? Uh, he kept muttering as he pulled up the hood of his bonus. Sorry about that, I cried. Then I dodged past him and married to greet Uncle Ben and my cousin. Uncle Ben shook my hand and said, With great power comes respect with great responsibility. Also, welcome to Cairo, Gabe. He was wearing a loose-fitting white short-sleeved sports shirt and baggy chinos. Baggy chinos. Baggy chinos. Sari wore faded denim cutoffs and a bright green tank top. She was already laughing at me. A bad start. Was that a friend of yours? She teased. I, I made a mistake, I confessed. I glanced back. The man was still scowling at me. Did you really think that was Daddy? So, I don't want to know. <laughs> so he demanded. I mumbled a reply. Sari and I were the same age, but I saw that she was still an inch taller than me. Who were? And she let her black hair grow. It fell back her, down her back in a single plait. Her big dark eyes sparkled excitedly. She loved making fun of me. I told them about my flight as we walked to the baggage area to get my suitcase. I told them how Nancy, the stewardess, kept slipping me bags of peanuts. I flew here last week, Sari told me. The stewardess let me sit in first class. Did you know you can have an ice cream sundae in first class? No, I didn't know that. I could see that Sari hadn't changed a bit. She goes to a boarding school in Chicago since Uncle Ben has been spending all of his time in Egypt. Of course, she gets straight A's. And she is a champion skier and tennis player. A champion skier? In Egypt? I suppose you could just go down the side of the pyramids. Hmm. Hmm. Cool bullshit on there. Sometimes I feel a little sorry for her. Her mum died when Sari was five. And Sari only gets to see her dad on holidays and during the summer. But as we waited for my suitcase to come out of the conveyor belt, I wasn't feeling sorry for her at all. She was busy about how this pyramid was twice as big as the ones I'd been on last summer, and how she'd already been down in it several times, and how she'd take me on a tour if I wasn't too afraid. Finally, my bulging blue suitcase arrived. I looked at it off the conveyor and dropped it at my feet. It weighed a ton. I tried to lift, but I could barely budge it. So it pushed me out of the way. Let me get that, she insisted. She grabbed the handle, raised the suitcase off the floor, and started off with it. Hi, I called after her. What a show off. Ogunbed grinned at me. I think Sari has been working out, he said. He put her hand on my shoulder and led me towards the glass doors. Let's get to the jeep. Go, oh, get to the jeep. We loaded the suitcase into the back of the jeep and headed towards the city. It's been swelteringly hot during the day, Uncle Ben told me, mopping his broad forehead with a handkerchief. And then cool at night. Traffic cooled on the narrow street. Horns honked constantly. Honk. Drivers kept their horns going whether they moved or stopped. The noise was deafening. Honk. We're not stopping in Cairo, Uncle Ben explained. We're going straight to the pyramid. At Al Giza. 
We're all living in tents out there, so we can be close to our work. There is a slight chance I will mispronounce a lot of Egyptian names. Just, we'll, we'll deal with it. We'll, we'll move on with our lives. I hope you bought insect repellents, so we can play. The mosquitoes are as big as frogs. Don't exaggerate, Uncle Ben scolded. Gabe isn't afraid of a few mosquitoes. Are you? No way, I replied quietly. How about scorpions? Sarah demanded. The traffic grew lighter as we left the city behind and headed into the desert. The yellow sand gleamed under the hot afternoon sun. Waves of heat rose up in front of us as the jeep bumped over a narrow two-lane road. Before long, a pyramid came into view. Behind the waves of heat of the desert floor, it looked like a wavering mirage. It didn't seem real. As I stared at it, my throat tightened with excitement. I had seen the pyramids last summer, but it was still a thrilling sight. I can't believe the pyramids are over 4,000 years old, I exclaimed. Unless you watch the History Channel, then it's aliens. Yeah, that's even older than me, Uncle Ben joked. His expression turned serious. It fills me with pride every time I see them, Gabe, he admitted. To think that our ancient ancestors were smart enough and skilled enough to build these marvels. Yeah, what a great cinematic universe that is. Uncle Ben was right. Oh, he's biased. He's from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, and a toot in his own horn. I suppose the pyramids have special meaning for me since my family is Egyptian. Both sets of my grandparents came from Egypt. They moved to the United States around 1930. My mum and dad were born in Michigan. I think of myself as a typical American kid, but there's still something exciting about visiting the country where your ancestors came from. As we drove nearer, the pyramid appeared to rise up in front of us. A shadow formed a long blue triangle over the yellow sand. Cars and tour buses jammed a small parking lot. I could see a row of saddled camels tethered to one side of the lot. A crowd of tourists stretched across the land, gazing up at the pyramid, snapping photographs, and chatting noisily and pointing. Uncle Ben turned the jeep to a narrow side road and we headed away from the crowd. Towards the back of the pyramid, as we drove into the shade, the air suddenly felt cooler. Why, was it wearing baggy pants or something? I'd kill for an ice cream cone, Sari wailed. I've never been so hot in all my life. Let's not talk about the heat, Uncle Ben replied, sweat dripping down his forehead into his bushy eyebrows. Let's talk about how happy you are to see your father after so many months. No, I'd rather talk about ice cream. Sari groaned. I'd be happier to see you if you were carrying an ice cream cone. Uncle Ben laughed. Uh... A khaki uniformed guard stepped in front of the jeep. Uncle Ben held up a blue ID card. The guard waved us past. As we followed the road behind the pyramid, a row of low white canvas tents came into view. Welcome to a pyramid Hilton, Uncle Ben joked. That's our luxury suite over there, he pointed to the nearest tent. It's pretty comfortable, he said, parking the jeep beside the tent. But the room service is lousy. And you have to watch out for scorpions, Sorry, watch warned. She'd say anything to try to scare me. We unloaded my suitcase, then Uncle Ben led us up to the base of the pyramid. A camera crew was packing up its equipment. A young man, covered in dust, because he was very old, climbed out in the low entrance dug into one of the limestone squares. He waved to my uncle, then hurried towards the tents. One of my people, Uncle Ben muttered. He motioned towards the pyramid. Well, here you are, Gabe. A long way from Michigan, eh? I nodded. It's amazing, I told him, shielding my eyes to gaze up to the top. I forgot how much bigger the pyramids look in person. Didn't you say that already earlier? Tomorrow I'll take you both down to the tomb, Uncle Ben promised. Is that a promise or a threat? You've come at just the right time. We've been digging for months and months. And at long last we are about to break the seal. You should have gone to the toilet before you started. And entered the tomb itself. Wow! Sorry. <clears throat> wow! I exclaimed. I wanted to be called in front of Sari, but I couldn't help it. I was really excited. Guess you'd be really famous after you opened the tomb, hey, Dad? Sari asked. She swatted a fly on her own. Ow. I'll be so famous, the flies will be afraid to bite you, Ben replied. By the way, do you know what they call flies in ancient Egypt? Sari and I shook her heads. No. I don't either, Uncle Ben said, grinning. One of his stupid jokes. That was a joke. I don't get it. 
Okay. His humor's about on par with mine, so that's something. He had an endless supply of them. His expression suddenly changed. Oh, that reminds me. I have a present for you, Gabe. A present? Now, where did I put it? He took both hands into the pockets of his baggy chinos. Baggy chinos. As he searched, I saw something move behind him. A shadow over my uncle's shoulder, back at the low opening to the pyramid. I squinted at it. The shadow moved. A figure stepped away slowly. At first I thought the sun was playing tricks on my eyes, but as I squinted harder, I realised I couldn't read the book anymore. I realised I was seeing correctly. The figure stepped out from the pyramid. Its face was covered in worn yellow gauze. So were its arms and its legs. I opened my mouth to cry out, but my voice choked in my throat. As I struggled to alert my uncle, the mummy stiffly reached out its arms and came staggering up behind him. Bum, bum, bum. Chapter 4 I saw Sorry's eyes grow wide with fright. She let out a low gasp. Uncle Ben! I finally managed to scream. Turn around! Ride it! It! My uncle narrowed his eyes at me, confused. The mummy staggered closer. Its eyes. His hands. Its hands. Not his eyes. His hands reached out menacingly. That, that's menacingly. Ah, uh, uh, immersion. <laughs> About to grab the back of Uncle Ben's neck. A mummy! I shrieked. Uncle Ben spun around. He let out a startled cry. It works! He shouted, pointing at the mummy with a trembling finger. He backed away as the mummy advanced. It worked! Ugh! A strange man escaped saw his lips. I turned and started to run. But then the mummy burst out laughing. It lowered its yellowed arms. Boo! It cried and laughed again. I turned and saw that Uncle Ben was laughing too. His dark eyes spiral, spa, spiral, sparkled, spiraled and sparkled. He was a weird man. It walks, it walks. He keeps saying that. Is he a Tourette? He repeated, shaking his head. He put his arm around the mummy's shoulder. I gaped at the two of them, my heart still pounding. This is John, Uncle Ben said, enjoying the joke he pulled on us. He's been doing a TV advert here. Some new kind of sticker bandage. Sticky bird bandages, John told us. They're just what your mummy ordered. Sticky bird bandages, that's what your mum ordered. It's not very good, is it? It's not even insult. Think harder. He and Uncle Ben joined an another good laugh like that. Has the humours off me? Then my uncle pointed to the camera crew, packing their equipment into a small van. They finished for the day, but John agreed to hang around and help me skate. Sorry rolled her eyes. Nice try, she added dryly. You'll have to do better than that, Daddy, to frighten me. And then she added, Poor Gabe, did you see his face? He was so freaked out, I thought he was going to spontaneously combust or something. Uncle Ben and John laughed. Ah. Uh, Hey, no way, I insisted, feeling my face turn red. How could Sari say that? When the mummy staggered out, I saw her gasp and back away. She was just as scared as I was. I heard you scream too, I told her. I didn't mean to sound so whiny. I just did that to help them scare you, Sari insisted. She tossed her long plate over her shoulder. Plat, not plate. She, she didn't have a hair, plate for her hair. Don't know her. I've got to run, John said, glancing at his wristwatch. As soon as we get back to the hotel, I'm going to hit the pool. And then I might swim in it, because my hand will hurt from hitting it. I may stay underwater for a week. He gave us a wave of his banded hands and went jogging to the van. Sorry, bandaged hand. Immersion. Why hadn't I noticed that he was wearing a wristwatch? I felt like a total dog. That's it, I cried angrily to my uncle. I'm never falling for one of your stupid jokes again. Never! He grinned at me and winked. What a bet. What about Gabe's present? Sari asked. What is it? Uncle Ben pulled something out of his pocket and held it up. A pendant on the string, made of clear orange glass. It gleamed in the, gleamed in the bright sunlight. He handed it to me. I moved it in my hand. 
feeling a smoothness as I examined it. What is it? I asked him. What kind of glass is this? This isn't glass, he replied. It's a clear stone called amber. He stepped closer to examine it along with me. Hold it up and look inside the pendant. I followed his instructions and saw a large brown bug inside. It looks like some kind of beetle, I said. It is a beetle, Uncle said, a squinting one. I to see it better. It's an ancient beetle called a scarab. It was trapped in the amber 4,000 years ago. As you can see, it's perfectly preserved. Hold on. Insects in amber? What year did this come out? Nineteen ninety four. A year after Jurassic Park. Plagiarism. That's what this is. For shame, R. L. Stein. For shame. That's really gross. Sorry, commented, making a face. She slapped Uncle Ben on the back. Great gift, Dad. A dead book. Remind me not to let you do our Christmas shopping. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Uncle Ben laughed. And he turned back to me. The scarab was very important to the ancient Egyptians, he said, rolling the amber pendant in his fingers, then dropping it back into my palm. They believed that scarabs were a symbol of immortality. I stared at the bug's dark shell, its six prickly legs perfectly preserved. To keep a scarab meant immortality, my uncle continued. But the bite of a scarab meant instant death. I know, we've seen the mummy with Brendan Fraser before. But said there was a lot of scarabs in there. Uh... Weird, Sari muttered. It's great looking, I told him. Is it really 4,000 years old? He nodded. Wear it around your neck, Gabe. Maybe it still has some of its ancient powers. I slipped the pendant over my head and adjusted it under my t-shirt. The amber stone felt cool against my skin. Thanks, Uncle Ben, I said. It's a great present. He mopped his sweaty forehead with a wadded up handkerchief. Immersion. Let's go back to the tent and get something cold to drink, he said. We took a few steps and then stopped when we saw Sari's face. Her entire body trembled. Her mouth dropped open and she pointed to my chest. The Sari, what is it? Uncle Ben cried. The, the scarab, she stammered. It escaped. I saw it. She pointed down. It's there. Huh? I spun away from her and bent down to find the scarab. Ow! I cried when I felt a sharp stab of pain in the back of my leg and realised the scarab had bitten me. Which means instant death. The end. That's all, thanks. Oh, fine. Not really. Chapter 5, which looks more like the uh, letter S. So, Chapter S. We've forgotten how numbers work. As so I grabbed a gasp in alarm. Not grab. <laughs> Learn to read me. As I grasped in alarm, Uncle Ben's words about that scarab rushed through my mind. To keep a scarab meant immortality, but a bite of a scarab meant instant death. Instant death. Yeah, we literally just had that line. Do you really need to repeat? No! I let out in a howl and spun around. And saw Sari hunched over on her knees, grinning, her hand outstretched. And realised she had pinched my leg. My heart still pounding, I grabbed the pendant and stared into the orange glassy stone. The scarab was still frozen inside, just as it had been for 4,000 years. Ah! I let out a howl of rage. Oh! I was mostly furious at myself. Was I going to fall for every stupid joke Uncle Ben and Sari played on me for this trip? If so, it was going to be a very long summer. I had always liked my cousin, except for the times when she was being so competitive and so superior. We always got along really well. But now I wanted to punch her. I wanted to say really nasty things to her. But I can't think of anything nasty enough. That was really mean, sorry, I said glumly, tucking the pendant under my t-shirt. Yes, it was, wasn't it? She replied, very pleased with herself. She's the kind of person that leaves hate raids on Twitter, isn't she? The cow. That night, I lay on my back on my narrow camp bed, staring up at the low temp roof. It's not very exciting. Listening. Listening to the brush of the wind against the tent door. The soft creak of the tent poles. The flap of the canvas. Uh, my next album, Flap of the Canvas, coming soon. 
I don't think I'd ever felt so alert. Turning my head, I could see the pale glow of moonlight through a crack in the tent door. Uh, uh, that's a follow-up album. Moonlight through a crack in my tent door. I could see the blades of dried grass of grass in the sand outside. I could see water stains on the tent wall over my head. I'll never get to sleep, I thought unhappily. I pushed and punched a flat pillow for the twentieth time, trying to fluff it up. The harsh wool blanket fell scratchy against my chin. Oh no, don't tell us our protagonist is a fluffer. Don't want that. I slept away from home before, but I'd always slept in a room of some kind. Not in the middle of a vast sandy desert in a tiny, flapping, creaking canvas tent. I wasn't scared. My uncle lay snoring away in his bed just a few feet across the tent. That's every reason to be scared, if you ask me. I was just alert. Very, very alert. So alert I could hear the swish of the palm trees outside, and I could hear the low hum of the car tires miles away on the narrow road, and I heard the thudding of my heart and something wriggled on my chest. I was so alert, I felt it instantly. Just a tickle, a quick light move. It could only be one thing, the scarab moving inside the amber pendant. No joke this time. No joke. It moved. I fumbled for the pendant in the dark, tossing down the blanket. I held it up in the moonlight. I could see the fat beetle in there, black in its orange prison. Did Jim move? I whispered to it. Did you wiggle your legs? I suddenly felt really stupid. Why was I whispering to a 4,000 year old insect? Why was I imagining that it was alive? We all asked ourselves that question every day. Annoyed with myself, I took the pendant back into my night shirt. I had no way of knowing how important the pendant would soon be to me. I had no way of knowing that the pendant held a secret that would either save my life or kill me. Ba, ba, ba. Chapter 6 The tent was already hot when I awoke the next morning. Bright little sunlight poured in through the open tent flap. Squinting across the light, I rubbed my eyes and stretched. <sighs> Uncle Ben had already gone out. My back ached. Yeah, I can relate to that. The camp bed was so hard. But I was too excited to worry about my back. I was going down into the pyramid this morning, to the entrance of an ancient tomb. I pulled on a clean t-shirt and the jeans I'd worn the day before. I adjusted the scabbard pendant under my t-shirt, and I carefully tucked the little mummy hand into the back pocket of my jeans. Yeah, he loves that. With the pendant on my mummy hand, I'm well protected, I told myself. Nothing bad can happen on this trip. I pulled a hairbrush through my thick black hair a few times and took my black and yellow Michigan Wolverine's cap off. Then I hurried to the mass tent to get some breakfast. The mess tent, not the mass tent. Unless, of course, the mess tent was massive. The sun was floating above the palm trees in the distance. The yellow desert sand gleamed brightly. I took a deep breath of fresh air and then realised I'd inhaled loads of sand and started coughing immediately. <coughs> Yuck. There must be some camels nearby, I decided. That air wasn't exactly fresh. I found Sarah and Uncle Ben having their breakfast, seated at the end of a long table in the mess tent. Uncle Ben wore his usual baggy chinos and short sleeve white sport shirt with coffee stains down the front. Sarah had a long black hair pulled straight back into a ponytail, and not a plait. She wore a black red tank top over white tennis shorts. They greeted me as I entered the tent. I poured myself a glass of orange juice, and since I didn't see any frosted flakes, filled a bowl with raisin bread. No frosted flakes in the desert. What kind of living conditions are these? Go home. Three of Uncle Ben's workers were eating at the other end of the table. They were talking excitedly about their work. We could go in today, I heard one of them say. It might take days to break down the seal on the tomb door, a young woman replied. I sat next door to Sari. Ne next to Sari, not next door. Tell me all about the tomb, I said to Uncle Ben. Whose tomb is it? What's in there? He chuckled. <laughs> Let me say a good morning before I launch into a lecture. Sarah leaned over my cereal bowl. Hey, look, she said, pointing. I got a lot more raisins than you did. I told you she could turn breakfast into a contest. Well, I got more pulpy my orange juice, I replied. It was just a joke, but she checked her ju juice glass to make sure. Pathetic. Uncle Ben wiped his mouth with a paper napkin. He took a long sip of black coffee. If I'm not mistaken, he began. The tomb we have discovered here belonged to a prince. Actually, a cousin of King Tutankhamun. <gasps> so many uh, 
Egyptian royalty, that it's always the same ones that you pick. Shama! Hey up! How are you doing? Nice to see you. Uh, that's King Tut, Cyrus uh, told me, interrupting. I know that, I replied shortly. King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922, Uncle Ben continued. The vast burial chambers was filled with most of Tut's treasures. It was the most amazing archaeological discovery of the century. A smile crossed his face. Until now. You think you found something even more amazing? I asked. I hadn't touched my cereal. I was too interested in Uncle Ben's story. He shrugged. There's no knowing of what's behind the tomb door until we open it, Cave. But I have my fingers crossed. I believe we found the burial chamber of Prince Koru. I thought if I said the villain's name, there'd be like a crack of lightning or something. <laughs> there normally is in the TV shows. And it's nice to see you. Yes. Always special to do a Goosebumps. I was going to do um, Please Don't Feed the Vampire, but it turns out that's not a normal Goosebumps film. It's like a Choose Your Own Adventure one. And that would be a bit weird to do. I was not saying I can't do it, but it'll be a lot shorter. So, meh. Anyway, Koru. He was the king's cousin, and he was said to be as wealthy as the king. And do you think all the Prince Koru's crowns and jewels and belongings are buried with him? Sorry, asked. Uncle Ben took the last sip of coffee and slicked the white mop across the table. Who knows, he replied. There could be amazing treasures in there, or it could be empty. Just an empty room. Then we'll, we'll turn it into a treasure room after that, I suppose. How could it be empty, I demanded. Why would there be an empty tomb in the pyramids? I don't know. Maybe they're uh, overscaled. Who knows? Grave robbers, Uncle Ben replied, frowning. Remember, Prince Koru was buried some time around 1300 BC. Over the centuries... I do remember how many more. Uh, over the centuries, thieves broke into the pyramids and robbed the treasures from our many burial chambers. He stood up and sighed. We may have been digging for all those mums, only to find an empty room. No way! I cried excitedly. I bet we'll find the prince's mummy in there, and millions of pounds worth of jewels. Oh, well done for saying pounds and not dollars. One point for your book. Uncle Ben smiled at me. Enough talk, he said. Finish your breakfast so we can go and find out. Oh, I thought it was going to go into Castlevania. But enough talk. How about you? Sorry, and I followed Uncle Ben out of the tent. He waved to two young men who came out of the supply tent, carrying digging equipment. Then he hurried over to talk to them. Sorry, and I lingered back. She turned to me, a serious expression on her face. Hey, Gabe, she said softly. Sorry I've been such a pain. You? A pain? I replied sarcastically. She didn't laugh. I'm a bit worried, she confessed. About Daddy. I glanced at Uncle Ben. He was slapping one of the young men on the back as he talked. His usual jolly self. Uncle Ben's rise. Yes, we've had Uncle Ben's rise. We've had Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. So, yeah. It's a bit of an easy, easy, easy comedy uh, opportunity. Why are you worried? I asked Sorry. Your dad is in a great mood. That's why I'm so worried, Sorry whispered. He's so happy and excited. He really thinks this is going to be a discovery that makes him famous. So? I demanded. So what if it turns out to be an empty room? Sorry replied, her dark eyes watching her father. What if grave robbers did strip the place? Or what if it isn't that prince's tomb after all? What if daddy breaks the seal, opens the door and finds nothing but a dusty old room filled with snakes? I've had it with his motherfucking snakes and his motherfucking pyramid. She sighed. Daddy will be heartbroken. Just heartbroken. He's counting on this so much, Gabe. I don't know if I'll be able to take the disappointment. Why look on the groomy side, I replied. What if? I stopped because Uncle Ben was hurrying back to us. Let's go back down to the chamber, he said excitedly. The workers think we are very close to uncovering the tomb entrance. He put an arm in each of our shoulders and guided us to the pyramid. As we stepped into the shade of the pyramid, the air grew cooler. The low entrance dug at the bottom of the back wall came into view. It was just big enough for us to enter one at a time. Peering into the narrow hole, we were. I saw that the tunnel dropped steeply. I hope I didn't fall, I thought. A heavy knot of fear tightened my stomach. I pictured myself falling and falling down an endless dark hole. Mainly, I didn't want to fall in front of Sai. I knew she'd never let me forget it. Uncle Ben handed Sari and me bright yellow hard hats. They had lights built into them, like miners' hats. Stick close together, he instructed. I remember last summer, 
You two wandered off and got us into a lot of trouble. We, we will, I stammered. I was trying not to sound nervous, but I couldn't help it. I glanced at Sally. She was just in a yellow hard hat over her hair. She was as calm and confident as ever. I'll lead the way, Uncle Ben said, putting the chin strap under his chin. He turned and started to lower himself into the hole. But a shrill cry from behind us made us all stop and turn around. Stop! Please stop! Don't go in! Well, if it is that sunny, and uh, they've got hats on, I suppose it's only fair that I uh, I put a hat on as well to um, to shield myself from the sun's rays, don't, don't you think? I, I think that'd be right. And we are going to go with the obvious one. How not to make yourself look pretty on the internet. There we go. That should stop the sun's rays. Anyway, don't go in. Sharp to seven. A young woman came running across the sand. Her long black hair flew behind her head as she ran. She carried a brown briefcase in one hand. A camera strapped around her neck bobbed in front of her. She stopped in front of us and smiled at Uncle Ben. Dr. Hassad? She asked breathlessly. My uncle nodded. A yours? He waited for her to catch her breath. Wow, she's really pretty, I thought. He had long black she had long black hair, sleek and shiny. She had a fringe cut straight across her forehead. Beneath the fringe were the most beautiful green eyes I'd ever seen. She was dressed in all white, a white suit jacket and white blouse over white slacks. She was short, only an inch or two short taller than Sari. She must be a movie star or something, I told myself. She's so great looking. She set her briefcase down in the sand and brushed back her long black hair. I bet, uh, a, if she's describing her as a beautiful lady, I bet she's got a beautiful voice as well. So she brushed back her long black hair and said, I'm sorry I shouted like that, Dr. Assad, she told my uncle. It's just that I needed to talk to you. I don't want you to disappear into the pyramid. Uncle Ben now is his eyes at her, studying her. How did you get past the security guard, he asked, pulling off the hard hat. I showed them a press card, she replied. I'm a reporter for the Cairo Sun. My name is Nyla Rahad. I was hoping... Nyla? Uncle Ben interrupted. What a pretty name. She smiled. Yes, my mother's named me after the river of life, the Nile. But your name's Nyla, not Nile. Idiot. Well, it's a very pretty name, Uncle Ben replied, his eyes twinkled. But I'm not ready to have any reporters write about our work here. Neither frowned and bit her lower lip. Ow. I spoke to Dr. Field in a few days ago, she said. My uncle's eyes widened in surprise. You did? Dr. Field didn't give me permission to write about your discovery, Nyla insisted. Her green eyes locked on my uncle. Well, we haven't discovered anything yet, Uncle Ben said sharply, nearly in Nyla's voice. There may not be anything to discover. That's not what Dr. Fielding told me. Nyla replied. He seemed confident that you were about to make a discovery that would shock the world. Uncle Ben laughed. Ah. Sometimes my partner gets excited and talks too much, he told Nyla. Nyla's eyes pleaded with my uncle. Please. What the fuck am I doing? May I come into the pyramid with you? She glanced at Sari and me. I see you have two other visitors. My daughter Sari and my nephew Gabe, Uncle Ben replied. Well, could I come down with them? Nyla pleaded. I promise I won't write a word for my paper until you give me permission. Uncle Ben rubbed his chin thoughtfully. He swung the hard hat back onto his head. No photographs either, he muttered. Does that mean I can come? Nyla asked excitedly. Uncle Ben nodded. As an observer, he was trying to act real tough, but I could see he liked her. Nyla flashed him a warm smile. Thank you, Dr. Hassad. He reached into his storage cart and handed her a yellow hard hat. We won't be making any amazing discoveries today, he warned her. But we're getting very close to something. <gasps> Not something, anything but that. As she slipped on the, the heavy helmet, Nyla turned to Sari and me. Is this your first time in the pyramid? she asked. Nowhere, I've already seen, been down three times, Sari boasted. The whore. It's really awesome. 
I just arrived yesterday, I said, so it's my first time down in. I stopped when I saw Nyla's expression change. Why was she staring at me like that? I glanced down and realised she was staring at an amber pendant. Her mouth was open in shock. No, I don't believe this. I really don't. That is so weird, she exclaimed. Chapter 8 What? What's wrong, I stammered. We're twins, Nyla declared. She reached under her suit jacket and pulled out a pendant she wore around her neck. An amber pendant shaped exactly like mine. How unusual, Uncle Ben exclaimed. Nyla grasped my pendant between her fingers and lowered her face to examine it. You have a scarab inside yours, she told me, turning the pendant round in her fingers. She dropped mine and held hers up for me to see. Look, Gabe, mine is empty. I gazed into her pendant. It looked like a clear orange glass, nothing inside. I think yours is prettier, so I retorted Myla. I won't want to wear a dead bug around my neck. But it's supposed to be a good look or something, Nyla replied in a normal voice. She took the pendant and back under her white jacket. I hope it isn't bad luck to have an empty one. I hope so too, Uncle Ben commented dryly. He turned and led us into the pyramid opening. I'm not really sure how I got lost. Sari and I were walking together behind Uncle Ben and Nyla. We were close behind them. I could hear my uncle explaining how he saw the walls of granite and limestone. Our helmet lights were on. The narrow beams of yellow light darted and crisscrossed over the dusty tunnel floor and walls as we made our way deeper and deeper into the pyramid. The ceiling hung low and we all had to stoop as we walked. The tunnel kept curving. There were several smaller tunnels that branched off. False starts and dead ends, Uncle Ben called them. It was hard to see in the flickering light from our helmets. I stumbled once and scraped my elbow against the tough one or tunnel wall. There we go. It was surprisingly cool down here, and I wish it had worn a sweatshirt or something. Up ahead, Uncle Ben was telling Nyla about King Tut and Prince Koru. It sounded to me as if Uncle Ben was trying to impress her. I wonder if he had a crush on her or something. This is so thrilling, I heard Nyla exclaim. It was so nice of Dr. Fielding to let, you s let me see it. Who is Dr. Fielding? I was pretty sorry. My father's partner, Sorry, whispered back. My daddy doesn't like him. You'll probably meet him. He's always around. I don't like him much either. Is he going to be the baddie? I stopped to examine a strange-looking marking on the sort of wall. It was shaped like some kind of animal head. Sorry, look, I whispered. An ancient drawing. Sorry, rolled her eyes. It's Bart Simpson, she muttered. One of daddy's workers must have drawn it. You get permission to use Bart Simpson's name? Damn. Uh, Bart Simpson, part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, confirmed. I knew that, I lied. I was just teasing you. When was I going to stop making a fool of myself in front of my cousin? I turned back from the stupid drawing of the wall and Sari had vanished. I could see the marrow beam of light from her hard hat up ahead. Hey, wait! I called. But the light disappeared as the tunnel curved away. And then I stumbled again. My helmet hit the tunnel wall. Ooh, uh, and the light went out. Hey, Sari? Uncle Ben? I called to them. I leaned heavily against the wall, afraid to move in the total darkness. Hey, can anybody hear me? My voice echoed down the narrow tunnel, but no one replied. I pulled off the hard hat and fiddled with the light. I turned it, trying to tighten it. This was not helping. Then I shook the whole hat, but the light wouldn't come back on. Sighing, I strapped the hat back onto my head. Now what, I thought, starting to feel a little afraid. My stomach began fluttering, my throat suddenly felt dry. Hey, can anybody hear me, I shouted. I'm in the door back here, I can't see. No reply. Where were they? Didn't they notice I had disappeared? Well, I'll just wait right here for them, I murmured to myself. I leaned my shoulder against the tunnel wall and fell right through the wall. No way to catch my balance, nothing to grab me. I was falling, falling down through total darkness. <gasps> Terrifying. Chapter 9. My hands flared wildly as I fell. I reached out frantically for something to grab onto. It all happened too fast to cry out. I landed hard on my back. Pain shot out through my arms and legs. The darkness swirled around me. My breath was knocked right out of me. I saw bright flashes of red, then everything went black again. I struggled to breathe, but couldn't suck in any air. I had that horrible, heavy feeling in my chest, like when a basketball hits you in the stomach. That's not my stomach. That's my stomach. I know what biology is. 
Finally, I sat up, struggling to see in the total darkness. I heard a soft, shuffling sound. Something scraping over a hard dirt floor. Hey, can anybody hear me? My voice came up with a hoarse whisper. Now my back ached, but I was starting to breathe normally. Hey, I'm down here, I called a little louder. No reply. Didn't they miss me? Weren't they looking for me? I was leaning back at my, my hands, starting to feel better. My right hand started to itch. I started to scratch it and brush something away. Then realised my legs were itching too. I felt something crawling on my left wrist. I shut my hand hard. What's going on here? I whispered to myself. My entire body tingled. I felt soft pinpricks up my arms and legs. Shaking both arms. That didn't help. <sighs> I jumped to my feet and banged my helmet against the low edge. Stop banging your helmet. It's not helpful. The light flickered on. I grasped when I saw the crawling creatures in the narrow beam of light. Spiders! Hundreds of them. Bulby, white spiders, thick on the chamber floor. They scuttled across the floor, climbing over each other. As I jerked my head up and the light swept up with it, I saw that the stone walls were covered with them too. The white spiders made the wall appear to move as if it were alive. Spiders hung on the invisible threads from the chamber mid-ceiling. They seemed to bob and float in mid-air. I shut one off the back of my hand. And, with a grasp, realised that my legs itched. Spiders were crawling all over them. Up my arms. Down my back. Help! Somebody! Please! I managed to cry out. But I felt a spider drop at the top of my head. I brushed it away with a frantic slap. Somebody! Help me! I screamed. Can anybody hear me? And then I saw something scarier. Much scarier. A snake slid down from above me, lowering itself rapidly towards my face. Chapter 10 I ducked and tried to cover my head as the snake suddenly dropped towards me. Grab it! I heard someone call. Grab onto it! With a startled cry, I raised my eyes. I can't raise my eyes. I can't physically take my eyes out of my head and raise them. What do you expect of me, Buck? The light beam followed, and I saw that it was not a snake that grabbed from above, but a rope. Grab onto it, Gabe. Hurry! Sorry, shouted urgently from high above. If you don't know the difference between a snake and a rope, you're going to have a bad time. Just saying. Pushing away spiders, kicking frantically to shake them off my trainers, I grasped the rope with both hands. I felt myself being tugged up, pulled up through the darkness to a tunnel floor above. A few seconds later, Uncle Ben reached down and grabbed me under the shoulders. As he hoisted me up, I could see Sari and Nyla pulling with all their might on the rope. I cheered happily as my foot touched solid ground, but I didn't have long to celebrate. My entire body felt it was on fire. I went wild, kicking my legs, brushing spiders off my arms, scratching spiders off my box. Off my back, off not off my box. Ugh. Stamping on the spiders as they scooted off. Leave the spiders alone. I didn't do anything to you, half to scare the shit out of you. You little bastard. Glancing up, I saw that Sari was laughing at me. Gabe, what do you call that dance? She asked. Uncle Ben and Nyla laughed too. How did you fall down there, Gabe? My uncle demanded, peering at us to the spider chamber. The wall. It gave away, I told him frantically in one mid-yawn, scratching my leg. I thought you were still with me, Sari explained. When I turned around, her voice trailed off. The light in Uncle Ben's helmet beamed down to the lower chamber. That's a long fall, Uncle Ben said, turning back at me. Are you sure you're okay? I nodded. Yeah, I think so. It knocked the wind out of me, and then the spiders. Not from Mars. There must be hundreds of chambers like this, my uncle commented, glancing at Nyla. The pyramid builders made a maze of tunnels and chambers to fool tomb robbers and keep them from finding the real tomb. Doesn't work on tomb raiders, though. Our Crawford will have this place emptied in no time. Yuck! Suck spiders! Zari groaned, stepping back. There are millions of them down there, I told her. Oh yeah, millions. Did you count every single one? Damn it. On the walls, hanging from the ceiling. Everywhere. This is going to give me bad dreams, Nala said softly, moving closer to Ben. You sure you're okay, my uncle demanded again. I started to reply, then I suddenly remembered something. The mummy hand. It was tucked in my back pocket. Had it been crushed when I landed on it? My heart skipped a beat. I didn't want anything bad to happen to that little hand. It was my good luck charm. I reached into my jeans pocket and pulled it out. Oh well. 
holding it under the light for my hard hat. I examined it carefully. I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw it was okay. It still felt cold, but it hadn't been crushed. What's that? Nada asked, leaning closer to see it better. She brushed her longer hair away from her face. Is that the summoner? How did you know that? I demanded, holding the hand up so she could see it better. Nida stared at it intently. I know a lot about ancient Egypt, she replied. I studied it my whole life. It might be an ancient relic, Uncle Ben broke in. Or it might just be a tacky souvenir, Sari added. It has real powers, I insisted, pushing it off carefully. I landed on it down there. I pointed to the spider chamber. And it didn't get crushed. I guess it is a good luck charm, Nyla said, turning back to Uncle Ben. Then why didn't you stop Gabe from falling through the wall? Sorry, Crack. Before I could answer, the mummy hand moved. The tiny fingers slowly curled out and then in. In, out, and then it shook it all about. I cried out and nearly dropped it. Gabe, now what? Uncle Ben demanded shortly. Uh, uh, nothing, I replied. They won't believe me anyway. Oh, yeah. Where am I yawning? I think I've done enough exploring for now, Uncle Ben said. As we made our way to the entrance, I held the mummy hand in front of me. I wasn't seeing things, I knew that for sure. The fingers really had moved, but why? Was the hand trying to signal me? Was this trying to warn me about something? What do you reckon, chat? What do you reckon's going on? I'm going to have a quick sippy. It's first it worked, is reading MacGuffin, you know. Ah, right then. Ahem. Chapter 11. Two days later, Uncle Ben's workers reached a doorway to the burial chamber. Sari and I had spent the two days hanging around in the tent to explore in the area outside the pyramid. Since it was mostly sand, there wasn't much to explore. We spent one after the long after... <laughs> We spent one long afternoon playing game after game with Scrabble. Playing Scrabble with Sai wasn't much fun at all. She is a very defensive player and spent hours figuring out ways to clog the board and block me from getting any good words. So she was playing the game normally, you know. I see. Whenever I put down a really good word, Sai claimed it wasn't a real word and couldn't be allowed. And since we didn't have a dictionary in the tent, she won most of the arguments. Uncle Ben, meanwhile, really stressed out. I thought maybe she was nervous about finally opening the tomb. I barely spoke to Sari and me. Instead, he spent a lot of time meeting with people I didn't recognise. He seemed very serious and businesslike. None of his usual backslapping and joking. Uncle Ben also spent a lot of time talking to Lila. At first, she said she wanted to write about his discovery in the pyramid. But now, she decided to write an article about him. She wrote down nearly every word he said in a little pad she carried with her. Then, at breakfast... He finally smiled for the first time in two days. Today's the day, he announced. Sorry, and I couldn't hide our excitement. Are you taking us with you? I asked. Uncle Ben nodded. I want you to be there, he replied. Perhaps we will make history today. Perhaps it will be a day you will want to remember for the rest of your lives, he shrugged, and added thoughtfully. Perhaps. A few minutes later, the few of us followed several workers across the sand towards the pyramid. It was a great day. Oh, sorry, it was a grey day, not a great day. Learn to read me. Heavy clouds hovered low in the sky, threatening rain. The pyramid rose up darkly to meet the clouds. As we approached the small opening in the black wall, Nana came running up, a camera bobbing in front of her. She wore a long sleeve blue denim work shirt over loose fitting faded jeans. Uncle Ben greeted her warmly. But still, no photographs, he told her firmly. From this? Nana smiled back at him. Her green eyes lit up excitedly. She raised her hand to her heart. Promise! We all took yellow hard hats from the equipment dump. I don't want to pick up any helmet from a place called a dump. No, thank you. Uncle Ben was carrying a large stone mallet. He lowered himself into the entrance and we followed. My heart was racing as I hurried to keep up with Sari. The lights from my helmets darted over the narrow tunnel. Far up ahead, I could hear the voices of workers and the steady scrape of their digging tools. This really is awesome, I exclaimed breathlessly to Sari. Maybe the tomb is filled with jewels, Sari whispered as we made our way around the curve. Sapphires and rubies and emeralds. 
the third generation of Pokemon. Awesome. Maybe I'll try to get on a crown jewel worn on by an ancient Egyptian princess. Do you think there's a mummy in the tomb? I asked. I wasn't too interested in jewels. Do you think the mummified body of Prince Koru is lying there, waiting to be discovered? Sorry, I made a disgusted face. Is that all you can think about? Mummies? Well, we are in the ancient Egyptian pyramid. I shot that. There could be millions of pounds worth of jewels and relics in that tomb, so I was scolded. And all you can think about is a mouldy old body wrapped up in tar and gauze. She shook her head. You know, most kids get over their fascination with mummies by the time they're eight or nine. Uncle Ben didn't, I replied. Ooh, sick burn. That shut her up. We followed Nilo and Uncle Ben in silence. After a while, the narrow tunnel curved up sharply. The air grew warmer as we followed it up. I could see lights ahead. Two battery-powered spotlights were trained on the far wall. As we grew closer, I realised it wasn't a wall. It was a door. Sorry. Four workers, two men and two women, were on their knees. What, what kind of work they're doing? Do we want to know? Working with small shovels and picks. They were scraping the last chunks of dirt away from the door. It looks beautiful, Uncle Ben cried, running up to the workers. They turned to greet him. It's awesome in the true sense of the word, he declared. Nyla, Sari and I stepped up behind him. Uncle Ben was right. The ancient door really was awesome. I wasn't very tall. I could see that Uncle Ben would have had to stoop to step into it. But it looked like a door fit for a prince. The dark mahogany wood, now petrified. Must have been bought from far away. I knew that kind of wood didn't come from any of the trees that grew in Egypt. Strange hieroglyphics covered the door from top to bottom. I recognised birds and cats and other animals etched deeply into the dark wood. The most startling sight of all was the seal that locked the door. A snarling lion's head, sculpted in gold. The light from the spotlights made the lion glow like the sun. The gold is soft, I heard one of the workers tell my Uncle Ben. The seal will break away easily. Uncle Ben lowered his heavy mallet to the ground. He stared for a long moment at the glowing lion's head and turned back to us. They thought this lion would scare any intruders away from the tomb, he exclaimed. I guess it worked. Till now. I ain't afraid of no lion. Dr. Hassad. Oh, sorry, wrong voice. <clears throat> Dr. Hassad, I have to photograph the actual breaking of the seal, Nida said, stepping up behind him. You really must let me. We can't let that moment go unrecorded. He looked at her thoughtfully. Well, okay, he agreed. A pleased smile across her face as she raised her camera. Thanks, Ben. The workers stepped back. One of them handed Ben a hammer and a delicate tool that looked like a doctor's scalpel. It's all yours, Dr. Hassad, she said. Uncle Ben raised the tools and stepped up to the seal. Once I break this seal... We'll open the door and step into a room that hasn't been seen in 4,000 years, he announced. Nyla steadied her camera over her eye, carefully adjusting the lens. Sari and I moved back up, besides the workers. The gold line appeared to grow brighter as Uncle Ben raised the tool. A hush fell over the tunnel. I could feel the excitement, feel the tension in the air. Such suspense. I realised I'd been holding my breath. I let out in a long... Silent whoosh and took another. <gasps> I glanced at Sari. She was nervously chewing her lower lip. Her hands were pressed tightly at her sides. Anyone hungry? Maybe we should forget about this and send out for pizza, Uncle Ben joked. We all laughed loudly. Uh, that was Uncle Ben for you, cracking the dumb joke at what might be the most exciting moment of his life. Tense silence returned, and everyone stopped laughing immediately because it wasn't funny. Uncle Ben's expression turned serious. He turned back to the ancient seal. He raised a small chisel to the back of the seal, and he started to lift the hammer. And then in a booming voice rang out, Please, let me rest in peace. It's in capitals, so you, you, know, you know it's terrifying. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, spoilers. Don't want to see that page, do you? You haven't read that one yet. Who knows? You might spoil the whole sh book. But let's read it anyway. Chapter 12. I let out a startled cry. Oh. 
Let me rest in peace, the booming voice repeated. I saw Ben lower his chisel and spun around, his eyes wide with surprise. I realised the voice came from behind us. I turned to see a man I'd never seen before, half hidden in this shadowy tunnel. He made his way towards us, taking long, steady strides. He was a tall, lanky man. So tall, he really had to hunch his shoulders in the low tunnel. Bold except for a fringe of dark hair at the ears. He had a slender face, an unfriendly scowl on his thin lips. He wore a perfectly ironed safari jacket over a shirt and tie. His black eyes, like little raisins, glared at my uncle. I wonder if the man ever ate. He was as skinny as a mummy himself. Omar! Uncle Ben started. I wasn't expecting you back from Cairo. Aw, oh, big booming man, what do you reckon? Shall we give him a silly voice? Yeah. I think he's going to be the uh, antagonist. It's building him up that way, isn't it? And it is a children's book. <clears throat> Let me rest in peace. Dr. Fielding repeated, soft at his tone. These are the words of Prince Karu, written on the ancient stone we found last month. That was the prince's wish. Omar, we've been over this before, my uncle replied, sighing. He lowered the hammer and chisel to his sides. Dr. Fielding pushed past Sari and me as if we weren't there. He stooped in front of my uncle and swept a hand back over his bald head. I don't have a bald head. Well then, can you see how to dare to break the seal? Dr. Fielding demanded. I am a scientist, my uncle replied slowly, speaking each word clearly and distinctly. I cannot allow superstition to stand in the way of discovery, Omar. I am also a scientist, Dr. Fielding replied, using both hands to tighten his tie. But I am not willing to defy this ancient tomb. I am not willing to go against the wishes of Prince Karu, and I am not willing to call the words of the hieroglyph mere superstitious. This is where we disagree, Uncle Ben said softly. He motioned to the four workers. We have spent too many months, too many years, to stop just outside the door. We have come this far, Omar. We must go the rest of the way. Dr. Fielding chewed his lower lip. There's a lot of that in this book for some reason. He pointed to the top of the door. <laughs> Fuck, I want to do it. Look, Ben, these are the same hieroglyphs as on the stone. The same warning. Let me rest in peace. I know, I know, my uncle said, frowning. The warning is very clear, Dr. Fielding continued heatedly. His tiny raisin eyes narrowed at my uncle. If anyone should deserve the prince, if anyone should repeat the ancient words written in the tomb five times, the mummified prince shall come to life, and he shall seek his vengeance on those who disturbed him. Listening to those words made me shudder. Well, it would have done if he'd not had a stupid voice. I stared hard at Uncle Ben. Why hadn't he ever told Sarmie May about the prince's threat? Why hadn't he ever mentioned the words of warning that he found on the ancient stone? Was he afraid he might frighten us? Was he frightened himself? No. No way. He didn't seem at all frightened now as he argued with Dr. Fielding. I could tell they had this argument before, and I could see there was no way that Dr. Fielding was going to stop my uncle from breaking the seal and entering the tomb. This is my final warning, Ben, Dr. Fielding said. For the sake of everyone here, he motioned with one hand to the four workers. Superstition, Uncle Ben replied. I cannot be stopped by superstition. I am a scientist. If he raised this chisel and hammer, the seal will be broken. Dr. Fielding tossed up both hands in disgust. I will not be patted to this, he declared. He spun around, nearly hitting his head on the tunnel ceiling, then muttering to himself, he hurried away, disappearing quickly into the darkness of the tomb. Uncle Ben took a couple of steps after him. Irma? Irma! But we could hear Dr. Fielding's footsteps going faint as he made his way out of the pyramid. Dr. Ben sighed and leaned close to me. I don't trust that man, he muttered. He doesn't really care about the old superstitions. He wants to steal this discovery for himself. That's why he tried to make me stop outside the door. I didn't know how to reply. My uncle's words startled me. I thought scientists have rules about who took credit for what discoveries. Uncle Ben whispered something to Nyla. Then he made his way back to the four workers. If any of you disagree with Dr. Fielding, he told them. Oh, sorry. If any of you agree with Dr. Fielding, he told them. You're free to leave now. 
The workers exchanged glances with one another. You have all heard the words of warning on the tomb door. I do not want to force anyone to enter the tomb, Uncle Ben told them. But we have worked so hard, one of the men said. We cannot stop here. We have no choice. We have to open the door. A smile crossed my uncle's face. I agree, he said, turning back to the lion seal. I glanced at Sari and realised that she was already staring at me. Gabe, if you're scared, Daddy will let you leave, she whispered. You don't want to have to be embarrassed. She never quits. I'm staying, I whispered back. But if you want me to walk you back to the tent, I will. A loud clink made us both turn back to the door. Uncle Ben was working to prize off the gold lion seal. Nyla had her camera poised. The workers stood tensely, watching Uncle Ben's every move. Uncle Ben worked slowly, carefully. He slid the chisel behind the ancient seal and gently prized the scrape. A few minutes later, the seal fell into my uncle's hands. Nyla bustily snapped photograph after photograph. Uncle Ben passed it to one of the workers. That's not a Christmas joke, he grabbed. I'm keeping that for my mantelpiece. Everyone laughed. Uh... Uncle Ben gripped the edge of the door with both hands. I'm going in first, he announced. But if I'm not back in 20 minutes, go and tell Dr. Fielding he was right. More laughter. Uh... Two of the workers moved to help Uncle Ben slide open the door. They pressed their shoulders against it, straining hard. <laughs> Too hard, one of them shouted. The door didn't push. It might need a little oiling, Uncle Ben joked. After all, it's been closed for 4,000 years. They worked for several minutes with picks and chisels, carefully freeing the door. And they tried once again, pressing their shoulders against the heavy mahogany door. Yes, Uncle Ben cried out as the door slid an inch. Then another inch. Another inch. Everyone pressed forward, eager to get a view of the ancient tomb. Two of the workers moved with large spotlights, aiming them into the doorway. As Uncle Ben and his two helpers pushed against the door, Sorry and I stepped beside Nyla. Nyla. Isn't this amazing? Nyla cried excitedly. I can't believe I'm the only reporter here. I'm so lucky. I'm lucky too, I realised. How many kids would give anything to be standing right where I am? How many kids would love to be one of the first people in the world to step into a 4,000-year-old tomb in the Egyptian pyramid? <laughs> How many times can you say Uncle Ben in one single chapter? Let's find out, Tricer. So. Or say, hey, how you doing? I imagine you've been lucky for some time, but hey, I hope you're well. Uh, I've lost my place. Uh, I don't know. I'll just say I'll just say the phrase Uncle Ben and leave them there. Uncle Ben! Which is not the next sentence. The faces of some of my friends back home suddenly popped into my mind. I realised I couldn't wait to tell them about my adventure here. The door scraped noisily against the dirt floor. Another inch. Another inch. The opening was almost big enough for a person to squeeze through. Move the light a little, Uncle Ben instructed. Another few inches and we can go in and shake hands with the prince. The door scraped open another inch. With a great heave, Uncle Ben and his helpers forced it open another few inches. Yes, he cried happily. Nihilus, that's a photograph. We all pressed forward eagerly. Uncle Ben. I'm keeping track now. <laughs> Sit for the opening first. Sorry bumped me out of the way and cut in front of me. My heart was pounding hard. My hands were suddenly ice cold. I don't care who went in first. I just wanted to go in. One by one, we slipped into the ancient chamber. Finally, my turn came. I took a deep breath, slipped for the opening, and saw... Nothing. Except for a lot of cobwebs, the chamber was bare. Totally bare. There's a bear in there! Run! Ah! Oh, are, you, are you enjoying the book, folks? I hope you are. Are you enjoying the stupid voices? How long is this book, anyway? We're on chapter 13. How long is his is book? book is 118 pages long. We're on chapter 63, so we're over halfway, apparently. Okay. Shall we do a uh, an Uncle Ben count? I want, I want you guys to keep track at home. I'll, I'll try and keep track. But there we are. Keep account for every time Uncle Ben is mentioned. <clears throat> That's your duty, guys. That and enjoying the stream. That too. <clears throat> Chapter 13. Lucky number 13. I let out a poor sigh. Poor Uncle Ben. Look, we couldn't even go one fucking sentence without him mentioning, could we? All that work for nothing. I felt so disappointed. I glanced around the bare chamber. 
The spotlights made the thick cobwebs grow like silver. Our shadows stretched across the dirt floor like ghosts. I found you silver and shadow here. I turned to Uncle Ben, expecting him to be disappointed too. But to my surprise, he had a smile on his face. Move the lights, he told one of the workers, and bring the tools. What, me? Oh, you mean work tools. Okay. We have another seal to remove. He pointed across the empty room to the back wall. In the grey light, I could make out the outline of the door. Another sculpted lines sealed it shut. I knew this wasn't the real burial chamber, Sari cried, grinning at me. As I said, the Egyptians often did this. Uncle Ben explained. They built several false chambers to hide the real chamber from grave robbers. He pulled off his hard hat and stretched his hair. In fact, he continued, we may find several empty chambers before we find Prince Koru's resting place. Niles, Nyla slapped a photo of Uncle Ben examining the newly discovered door. She smiled at me. You should have seen the expression on your face, Gabe, she said, and not her voice. You look so disappointed. I thought, I started, but the scrape of Uncle Ben. The chisel against the seal made me stop. We all turned to watch him work at the seal, staring across the cobweb-filled chamber. I tried to imagine what waited us on the other side of the door. Another empty chamber? Or a 4,000-year-old Egyptian prince, surrounded by all of his treasures and belongings. Work on the door went slowly. We all broke for lunch and then returned. That afternoon, Uncle Ben... I shouldn't have done that across my place. Uncle Ben and his helpers worked for another couple of hours, carefully trying to remove the seal without damaging it. As they worked, Sarah and I sat on the floor and watched. The air was hot and a bit sour. I suppose it was an ancient air. Sarah and I talked about last summer and the adventures we had in the Great Pyramid. Neither slapped our picture. Almost got it! Uncle Ben announced. We all started to get excited again. Sarah and I climbed to our feet and crossed the room to get a better view. The lion seal flipped free from the door. Two of the workers placed it onto a padded grate, and Uncle Ben... That's eight. That's eight times now. Uh, the two workers swept to work opening the door. Uh, this door proved even more difficult than the last. It's really stuck, Uncle Ben. That's, that's nine times. He and the workers pulled out more tools and began prising and chipping away at the hard crust that had formed on the doorway over the centuries. An hour later, they got to the door to slide an inch, then another inch, another. And when it had slid halfway open, Uncle Ben, ten, removed the light from his helmet and beamed it through the opening. He peered into the next chamber for the longest time without saying a word. Sorry, and I moved closer. My heart began racing again. What did he see, I wondered. What was staring at it so silently? Finally, Uncle Ben lowered the light and turned back to us. We've made a big mistake, he said quietly. Okay, that chapter was only three pages. Uncle Ben was mentioned 11 times. Do you think Arvo Stein was trying to pad out the work out or something? Trying to meet a deadline. So he just didn't call him Ben, he just called him Uncle Ben every fucking time. Uh, that's one way to get a paycheck, I suppose. And then chapter 14. A shocked silence fell over the room. I swallowed hard. Who, uh... Stunned by my uncle's words. Oh, just your uncle's words. Not your Uncle Ben's words. Fuck. <laughs> but then a broad smile across his face. We made the mistake by underestimating our discovery, he exclaimed. This will be more important than the discovery of King Tut. This tomb is even grander. <laughs> Who's uncle? I know. How will we ever know whose uncle it is? I don't know. He... It could be Omar's uncle. Well, I'll be an uncle of an Omar. Well, I'll be a mummy's uncle. Ah. A gleeful cheer echoed against the stone walls. The workers rushed forward to shake Uncle Ben's hand and offer their congratulations. Congratulations to us all, Uncle Ben! declared happily. We were all laughing and talking excitedly as we slipped from the narrow opening into the next chamber. As the lights beamed over the vast room, I knew I had seen something I will never forget. Even the thick layer of dust and cobwebs could not cover the amazing treasures that filled the chamber. My eyes darted quickly around. I struggled to focus on it all, but there was too much to see. I actually felt dizzy. The walls were covered from floor to ceiling with hieroglyphics etched into the stone. The floor was cluttered with furniture and other objects. 
It looked more like someone's attic or a storeroom than a tomb. A tall, straight-back throne caught my eye. It had a golden radiating sun etched into the seat back. Behind it, I saw chairs and benches and a long couch. Twist is, all of it's junk, and uh, the prince was just a hoarder. It just didn't part of anything. Well, there's people you see in those programs that have problems. Against the wall were stacked dozens of stone and clay jars. Some were cracked and broken, but many were in perfect condition. A gold monkey's head lay on its side in the middle of the floor. Behind it, several large chests. Just the head, not the rest of the monkey. Where's the rest of the monkey? Uncle Ben. And one of his workers carefully pulled back the lid of one of the chests. Her eyes grew wide as the gate inside. Jewellery! Uncle Ben declared. It's filled with gold jewellery. Sari came up beside me, an excited grin on her face. This is awesome! She nodded in agreement. Awesome! In the same tone of voice. We whispered in this heavy silence. No one else talked. Everyone was too overwhelmed by the amazing sight. The loudest sound was the clicking of Nyla's camera. Uncle Ben stepped between Sari and me and placed her hand on our shoulders. Isn't this unbelievable, he cried. It's all in perfect condition, untouched for 4,000 years. When I glanced up at him, he saw that he had tears in his eyes. This is the greatest moment of Uncle Ben's life, I realised. We must be very careful, Uncle Ben started. But he stopped in mid-sentence, and I saw his expression change. When he guided Sari and me across the room, I saw what he was staring at. A large stone mummy case, hidden in shadows, stood against the far wall. Oh... Wow, I murmured as we stepped towards it. Made of smooth grey stone, the heavy lid had a long crack down the centre. Is the prince buried inside it? Sari asked eagerly. It took Uncle Ben a moment to reply. He stood between us, his eyes locked in the ancient mummy case. We'll soon see, he finally replied. As he and the four workers struggled to move the lid, Nyla lowered her camera and stepped forward to watch. Her green eyes stared intensely as the lid slowly slid away. Inside was a coffin in the shape of a mummy. It wasn't very long, and is narrower than I thought it would be. The worker slowly prized open the coffin's lid. I gasped and grabbed Uncle Ben's hand as the mummy was revealed. It looked so tiny and frail. Prince Carew, Uncle Ben! Ran out of fingers. Muttered. Stared down into the stone case. The prince lay on his back, his slender arms crossed over his chest. Black tar had seeped through the bandages. The gauze had worn away from the head, revealing the tar covered skull. As I leaned over the case, the, my heart in my throat, the black tar and eyes seemed to have stared helplessly up at me. There's a real person in there, I thought. Finger a chill run down my spine. He's about my size, and he died. Well, uh, ever the optimist. And they covered him with hot tar and cloth. He's been lying in this case for 4,000 years. A real person. A royal prince. I stared at the stained cracked tar that covered his face. At the gauze like cloth, all frayed and yellowed. At the stiff body, so frail and small. He said that already. He was alive once, I thought. He said that as well. Did he ever dream that 4,000 years later, people would open his coffin and stare at him? Stare at his mummified body? It's getting a bit repetitive, isn't it? I, I really think I was still trying to fill a, a word count quote with. I took a step back to catch my breath. It was too exciting. I saw that Nyla had also had tears in her eyes. She rested both hands at the edge of the case and leaned over the prince's body. Her eyes locked on her bracken face. These may be the best preserved remains ever found, Uncle Ben. And he was mentioned for the eleventh time, then. said quietly. Of course, we will have to do many tests to determine the young man's identity. But, judging from everything I've seen in the chamber, I think it's safe to say... His voice trailed off as he heard sounds from the outer chamber. Footsteps. Voices. I spun around towards the doorway as four black uniformed police officers burst into the room. Okay, everybody take one step back, one of them ordered, lowering his hands to the gun holster at his side. <gasps> Not the Pope, ho! What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do when the mummy's after you? Oh, quick drinky. Well, 
Right. That was 11 instances of Uncle Ben. Same as the last chapter, you know? Because he mentioned 11 times in every chapter. Only time will tell. Him, 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 Chapter 15. Startled cries filled the room. Uncle Ben. Yep, not even one fucking sentence again. Uncle Ben spun around, his eyes wide with surprise. What is happening? he cried. The four Cairo police officers, their features set in half rounds, moved quietly into the centre of the room. Be careful, Uncle Ben warned, standing in front of the mummy case, as if protecting it. Do not move anything. It is all terribly fragile. It's like my ego. He pulled off the hard hat. His eyes went from officer to officer. What are you doing here? What are you doing in my pyramid? I asked them to come. A voice boomed from the doorway. Dr. Fielding entered. A pleased expression on his face. His tiny eyes danced excitedly. Newer Wormstrom! No, wait, that's the wrong series. One point if you know what it's from. Then. Emma, I don't understand, Uncle Ben said, taking a few steps towards the other scientist. <sighs> I have had it best to protect the contents of the room, Dr. Fielding replies. His gaze quickly around. Oh, he gazed quickly around the room, taking in the treasures. Wonderful! This is wonderful! he cried. He stepped forward and shook my uncle's hand enthusiastically. Congratulations, everyone, he boomed. This is almost too much to believe. Uncle Brens. Oh, forget it. I ain't, I'm stopped counting. That's four. Geek track at home. Uncle Brens' expression softened. I still do not understand the need for them, he said, motioning the grim faced officers. No one in this room is about to steal anything. Certainly not, Dr. Fielding replied, still squeezing Uncle Ben's hand. Certainly not, but word will soon get out, Ben, and I thought we should be prepared to guard what we have found. Uncle Ben eyed the four officers suspiciously, but then he shrugged his broad shoulders. Perhaps you are right, he told Dr. Fielding. Perhaps you are being sensible. Just ignore them. Dr. Fielding replied. He slapped my uncle on the back. I owe you an apology, Ben. I was wrong to try and stop you before. As a scientist, I should have known better. We owed it to the world to open this tomb. I hope you'll forgive me. We have much to celebrate, don't we? I don't trust him, Uncle Ben confided that evening as we walked from the tent to dinner. He said that already. I don't trust my partner at all. What, because he's clearly fucking evil? It was a clear night, surprisingly cool. The purple sky was dotted with a million twinkling white stars. A steady breeze made the palm trees sway on the horizon. The big campfire up ahead dipped and shifted with the wind. We stopped to field in coming with us to dinner, Sari asked. She wore a pale green sweater, pulled down over the black leggings. Uncle Ben shook his head. No, he hurried to the phone Cairo. I think he's eager to tell our backers the good news. He seemed really excited when he saw the mummy and everything, I said, glancing at the pyramid, rising darkly to the evening sky. Yes, he did, my uncle admitted. Just the uncle? Who's uncle? Who could it possibly be? It just says uncle. I, I'm lost now. I've got no idea who this character is. He certainly changed his mind in a hurry, but I'm keeping my eye on him. Omar would like nothing better than to take over the project. I'm going to keep an eye on these police officers of his too. Daddy, this should be a happy night, Sari scolded. Let's not talk of Dr. Fielding. Let's just talk about Prince Karoo and how you're going to be rich and famous. Uncle Ben laughed. It's a deal, he told her. Neil Nyla was waiting for us by the campfire. Uncle Ben had been invited to join us for a barbecue. She was wearing a white sweatshirt over loose-fitting jeans. Her amber pendant caught the light from the half-moon, just rising over the tents. She looked really pretty. She flashed Uncle Ben a warm smile as we came near. I could tell her by his face that he liked her. Sarah, you're taller than Gabe, aren't you? Nyla commented. Sarah grinned. She loved being taller than me, even though I'm a little older. Less than an inch, I said quickly. People are definitely getting taller, Nyla said to my uncle. Prince Karu was so short, he'd be a midget today. You can't say that, Nyla. It's not on PC, Nyla. It makes you wonder why such short people built such tall pyramids, Uncle Ben said, grinning. Napoleon complex, is it? Mm -hmm. Nida smiled and took his arm. 
Sari and I exchanged glances. I could see what Sari was thinking. Her expression said, What's up with those two? We had a great dinner. Uncle Ben burned the hamburger rolls a little, but no one really minded. Sari down two hamburgers. She could only eat that one. I could only eat one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Pardon me. I could only eat one. I gave her something else to boast about. I was getting really fed up with her bragging cousin. I find myself trying to think of a way to get back at her. Nyla and Uncle Ben kidded around a lot. That burial chamber looked a lot like a film set. Nyla teased my uncle. It was all too perfect. All that gold. And that perfect little mummy. It's all a fake. That's what I'm going to write in my article. Uncle Ben laughed. He turned to me. Did you check out the mummy, Gabe? Was this one wearing a wristwatch? She shook my head. No wristwatch. See? Uncle Ben told Nyla. No wristwatch. So it's got to be real. I guess that proves it, Nyla said, smiling warmly at my uncle. Daddy, do you know the words to bring the mummy to life? Sarah broke in. You know, the words on the tomb that Dr. Fielding was talking about. Uncle Ben swallowed the last bite of his hamburger. He wiped the grease off his chin with a napkin. I can't believe that a serious scientist would believe such superstition, he murmured. But what are the six words to bring the mummy back to life? Nyla demanded. Come on, Ben, tell us. Uncle Ben's smile faded. He shook his finger at Nyla. Oh no. I don't trust you. Also, I did a really crap Sonic the Hedgehog menu impression. If I tell you the words, you'll bring the mummy back to life just to get a good photograph of your newspaper. We all laughed. Ha. Huh. We were sitting around the campfire, its orange light flickering over our faces. Uncle Ben set his plate down on the ground and spread his hands over the fire. Teki Karu, Teki Kara, Teki Kari, he chanted in a loud, deep voice, waving his hands over the flames. The fires crackled. A twig made a loud popping sound that made my heart skip a beat. Are those the secret words? Sari demanded. Uncle Ben nodded solemnly. Those are the words of the hieroglyphs over the entrance of the tomb. It's hardly uh, the words from the evil dead, is it? Katu, Verata, Niktu. There we are. So maybe the mummy just sat up and stretched? Sari asked. I'd be very surprised, Uncle Ben replied, climbing to his feet. You're forgetting, Sari. You have to chant the words five times. Oh. Sari stated carefully into the fire. I repeated the words of my mean. In my, in my mind, in my mind, not my mind. Tikikaru, tikikari, tikikari. Are you all saying it at home five times? Like, uh, like Candyman. I needed to memorise the words. I had a plan to scare Sari. Where are you going? Nyla asked my uncle. To the communications tent, he replied. I have to make a phone call. He turned his way quickly over the sand towards the row of canvas tents. Nyla let out a surprised laugh. He didn't even say a good night. Daddy's always like that, Sari explained, when he has something on his mind. Best I get a go too, Nyla said, climbing to her feet and pushing sand off her jeans. I'm going to start writing my story for the paper. She said good night and walked away quickly. Her sandal was making a slapping sound against the sand. I can't do a slapping sound, it turns out. Sari and I sat staring into the crackling fire. The half moon had floated high in the sky. Its pale light reflected off the top of the pyramid in the distance. Neither is right, I told Sari. It really did look like a film set in there. Sari didn't reply. She stared into the fire without blinking, thinking hard. Something in the fire popped again. The sound seemed to snap her out of her thoughts. Do you think Nyla likes Daddy? She asked me, her dark eyes locking on mine. Yeah, I think so, I replied. She's always giving him a smile. I imitated Nyla's smile. She's always kind of teasing him. Sorry, I thought about my reply. And do you think Daddy likes her? Why don't you ask him? I grinned. For sure. I stood up. I was eager to get back to the tent. I wanted to scare Sari. We walked towards the tents in silence. I guess that Sari was still thinking about her dad and Nyla. The night air was cool, but it was warm inside the tent. Moonlight flitted through the canvas. Sari pulled her trunk out from under her camp bed and got down on her knees to search for her clothes. Sorry, I whispered. Dare me to recite the ancient words five times? Huh? She gazed up from the trunk. I'm going to chant the words five times, I told her. You know, 
see if anything happens. I expected her to beg me not to. I expected her to get scared and plead. Please, Gabe, don't do it. Don't. It's too dangerous. Drama. But instead, Sabi turned back to her clothes drawing and said, Hey, give it a try, she told me. You sure? I asked her. Yeah, why not, she replied, pulling out a pair of denim clothes. I stared across the tent at her. Was that fear I saw in her eyes? Was she just pretending to be so casual about it? Yeah. Okay, I started yawning. I think Sari was a little scared and trying hard not to show it. I took a few steps closer and chanted the ancient words in the same low voice Uncle Ben had used. Tekikaru, Tekikara, Tekikari. Sari dropped the jeans and turned to watch me. I repeated the chant a second time. Tekikaru, Tekikara, Tekikari. A fourth time. I'm going to do it because I'm free. So let's do it. Because it doesn't do it in the book. It just says a third or fourth time. I'm the coward. Tekikaru, Tekikara, Tekikari. Tekikaru, Tekikara, Tekikari. Tekikaru, Tekikaru, Tekikari. You know when you say words so many times, it just, words just lose all meaning. Tekikaru, Tekikara, Tekikari. I hesitated. I felt a cold breeze tingle the back of my head. Should I chant the words again? Should I go to number five? I think you should. Chapter 16. Ooh, there's been very little mummy in this return of mummy so far. Should have been the return of Dr. Uncle Ben. Dr. Uncle Ben, yes. He is a doctor, so yeah. Anyway, chapter 16. I stared down at Sari. She had closed the trunk lid and I was leaning on it tensely, staring back at me. I could see that she was frightened. She chewed her butt on lip. Again with the lip chewing. I felt another chill at the back of my neck. It's just superstition, I told myself. 4,000 year old superstition. There's no way that mouldy old mummified prince is going to come back to life just because I recited six words I don't even know the meaning of. No way. I suddenly thought about all the old films I've watched about mummies in ancient Egypt. In the films, the scientists always ignored ancient curses, warning them not to disturb them in these tombs. Then, the mummies always came to life to get their revenge. They staggered around, grabbed the scientists by the throat, and strangled them. Stupid films, but I love them. Now, staring down at Sari, I saw she was really scared. I took a deep breath. I suddenly realised I felt scared too. But it wasn't too late. I had gone too far. I couldn't chicken out now. Tekikaru, tekikari, tekikari. I shouted the fifth time. I froze and waited. I don't know what I expected. A flash of lightning, maybe. So I reclined to her feet. She tugged at a strand of dark hair. Admit it. You're totally freaked, I said, unable to keep a grin from spreading across my face. No way, she insisted. Go ahead, Gabe. Chant the words again. Chant them a hundred times. You're not going to scare me. No way. But we both gasped when we suddenly saw a dark shadow roll over the tent wall. And my heart completely stopped when a hoarse voice whispered into the tent. Are you in there? That was a short chapter. Chapter 17. My legs trembled as I stumbled back, closer to Sarah. I could see her eyes go wide with surprise and fear. The shadow moved quickly towards the tent opening. We had no time to scream, no time to call for help. Gaping into the darkness, I saw the flap pull open, and a smooth head poked into the tent. Oh! I let out a terrified moan as the dark figure slumped towards me. The mummy is alive! The horrifying thought swept through my mind as I backed away. The mummy is alive! Dr. Fielding? Sari cried. Huh? I was going to see Betty. Yes, it was Dr. Fielding. I struggled to say hello, but my heart was panning so hard I couldn't speak. I took a long, deep breath and held it. I'm looking for your father, Dr. Fielding told Sari. I must see him at once. It's extremely urgent. He's making a phone call, Sari replied in a shaky voice. Dr. Fielding spun round and ducked out of the tent. The flap snapped shut back behind him. I turned to Sari. My heart still pounding. He scared me to death, I confessed. I thought he was in Cairo when he poked that skinny bard head into the tent. Sorry, laughed. He really does look like a mummy, doesn't he? The smile faded. I wonder that's why he's in such a hurry to see Daddy. Let's follow him, I urged. The idea just popped into my head. Yes, let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's see. I hadn't expected Sorry to agree so quickly, but she was quickly pushing open the tent flap. I followed her out of the tent. The night had grown cooler. A steady wind made all the tents appear to shiver. 
Which way did he go? I whispered. She pointed. I think that's the communications tent at the end. She started jogging across the sand. As we ran, the wind blew sand against our legs. I heard music and voices from one of the tents. The workers were celebrating the day's discovery. The moon cast a strip of light like a carpet along our path. Up ahead, I could see Dr. Fielding's lanky body leaning forward, lurching awkwardly towards the last tent. Imagine that was awkward. Actually, it kind of was awkward, wasn't it? <clears throat> he disappeared around the side of it. Sari and I stopped a few tents away. We ducked out of the moonlight into deep shadows where we wouldn't be seen. I could hear Dr. Fieldy's booming voice coming from the communications tent. He was talking rapidly, exciting. What is he saying? Sari whispered. I couldn't make out the words. A few seconds later, two figures emerged from the tent, carrying bright torches. They crossed a strip of yellow moonlight, then moved quickly into the shadow. Dr. Fielding appeared to be pulling Uncle Ben, pulling him towards the pyramid. What's going on? Sorry, whispered, grabbing my sleeve. Is he forcing Daddy to go with him? The wind swelled the... Uh, uh. Let me try this again. The wind swelled the sand around us. I shivered. The two men were talking at the same time, shouting and gesturing with their torches. They were arguing about something, I realised. Dr. Fielding had a hand on Uncle Ben's shoulder. Was he shoving Uncle Ben towards the pyramid, or was Uncle Ben actually leading the way? It was impossible to tell. Let's go, I whispered to Sarah. We stepped away from the tent and started to follow them. We walked slowly, keeping them in view, but be careful not to get too close. If they turn back, they'll see us, Sari whispered, huddling close to me as we crept the sand. She was right. There were no trees or bushes to hide behind here on the open desert. Maybe they won't turn back, I replied hopefully. Crept closer. The pyramid rose up darkly in front of us. We saw Dr. Fielding and Uncle Ben stop at the opening in the side. I could hear their excited voices, but the wind carried away their words. They all seemed to be arguing. Uncle Ben disappeared into the pyramid first. Dr. Fielding went in right behind him. Did he shove Daddy in? Sarah demanded to a shrill, frightened voice. It looked like he pushed him inside. I, I don't know, he stammered. We made our way closer to the entrance, then we both stopped and stared into the darkness. I knew we were both thinking the same thing. I knew we had both the same question on our lips. Should we follow them in? I think you should, because otherwise there won't be much book left. Let's have a quick sec. I hope, chat, you're really enjoying this book. Uh, it's been uh, Welcome to Camp Nightmare. That was so dumb. Chapter 18 Sari and I exchanged glances. The pyramid seemed so much bigger at night, and so much darker. The gushing wind howled around its walls, as if warning us to stay back. We crept behind a pile of stones left by the workers. Let's wait here for Daddy to come out, Sari suggested. I didn't argue with her. We had no torches, no light of any kind. I didn't think we'd get very far wandering the dark tunnels by ourselves. I pressed up against the smooth stones and stared at the pyramid opening. So I gazed up at the half moon, thin wisps of cloud floating over it. The dark, no, the ground darkened in front of us. You don't think Daddy is any kind of trouble, do you? Sari asked. I mean, he told us. He didn't trust Dr. Fielding, and then. I'm sure Uncle Benny's okay, I told her. I mean, Dr. Fielding is a scientist. He's not a criminal or anything. Whatever game. Game? Book? I'm doing the wrong thing. Oh, God. Why did he force Daddy into the pyramid in the middle of the night? Sari asked really. And what were they arguing about? I shrugged in reply. Shrugged. Shrugged. That's a word. We invented a word, everyone. I shrugged. He replied. I don't I don't remember ever seeing Sari so frightened. Normally I would have enjoyed it. She always bragged about how brave and fearless she was. Especially compared to me. But there was no way I could enjoy this. Mainly because I was just as scared as she was. It did look as if the two scientists were fighting, and it did look as if Dr. Fielding pushed Uncle Ben into the pyramid. Mm. Sari so crossed her arms over the sweater again, and narrowed her eyes at the opening. The wind fluttered her hair, blew strands across her forehead, but she made no attempt to brush them away. What could be so important, she demanded. Why did they have to go into the pyramid now? Do you think something was stolen? Aren't those police officers in Cairo down there guarding the police? Guarding. No, the police are not guarding the police. 
The police are, in fact, guarding the place. I saw the four policemen leave, I told her. They piled into their little car and drove away. Just before dinner. I don't know why. Maybe they were called back to the city. I, I'm just confused, Sarah so admitted. And worried. I didn't like the look on Dr. Fielding's face. I didn't like the way he was so rude. So bursting into the tent like that. Scaring us half to death. Not even saying hi. Calm down, Sari, I said softly. Let's just wait. Everything will be okay. She let out a sigh. But didn't say anything in reply. We waited in silence. I don't know how much time went by. It seemed like hours and hours. The shiver of a cloud drifted away from the moon. The wind continued to howl eerily around the side of the pyramid. Where are they? What are they doing in there? Sari demanded. I started to reply, but stopped when I saw a flicker of light at the pyramid opening. I grabbed Sari's arm. Look! I whispered. The light grew brighter. A figure emerged, pulling himself out quickly. Dr. Fielding! As he stepped into the moonlight, I caught the strange expression on his face. His tiny black eyes were wide and seemed to be rolling around crazily in his head. His eyebrows twitched. His head was twisted open. His, sorry, his, head. his mouth was twisted open. That would be a horrific sight. He seemed to be breathing hard. Dr. Fielding brushed himself off of his hands and began walking away from the pyramid. He was half walking, half staggering, taking long, quick strides with his lanky legs. But where's Daddy? Sari replied. Leaning out for the rocks, I could see the pyramid opening clearly. No light flickered. No sign of Uncle Ben. He isn't coming out, Sari stammered. And before I could react, Sari leapt out from the hiding place behind the stones and leapt into Dr. Fielding's path. Dr. Fielding! She cried loudly. Where is my dad? I pushed myself away from the stones and hurried after Sari. I could see Dr. Fielding's eyes spinning wildly. He didn't answer a question. Where is my dad? Sari repeated shrilly. Dr. Fielding asked as if he didn't see Sari. He stepped past her, walking stiffly, awkwardly, his arms straight down. Dr. Fielding? Sarah called after him. He hurried through the darkness towards the row of tents. Sari turned back at me, her features tight with fear. He's done something to Daddy, she cried. I know he has. Dun, dun, dun. Moving on. Chapter 19. I turned back to the pyramid opening, still dark and silent. The only sound now was the howling of the wind around the stone pyramid wall. Dr. Fielding, totally ignore me. Sari cried, her face revealing anger. He stormed past me as if I weren't there. I, I know, I stammered weakly. And did you see the look on his face, she demanded. So evil, so totally evil. Sorry, I started. Maybe, Gabe, we have to go and find Daddy. Sorry interrupted. She grabbed my arm and started pulling me towards the pyramid opening. Hurry! No, sorry, wait, I insisted. Tugging out of her grasp. We can't go stumbling around the pyramid in the dark. We'll just get lost. We'll never find Uncle Ben. We'll go back to the tent and get lights. She replied. Quick, Gabe. I raised my hand to stop her. Wait here, sorry, I instructed. Watch out for your dad. Chances are he'll be climbing out in a few moments. I'll run to get some torches. Staring at the dark opening, she started to argue, but then she changed her mind and agreed to my plan. My heart pounding. I ran all the way back to the tent. I stopped at the tent's opening and gazed down to the row of tents, searching for Dr. Fielding. No sign of him. In the tent I grabbed two torches, then I went hurtling back towards the pyramid. Please, I begged silently as I ran. Please be out of the pyramid, Uncle Ben. Please be safe. But as I frantically made my way over to the sand, I could see Starvi standing by herself. Even from a distance I could see her frightened expression as she paced tensely back and forth in front of the pyramid opening. Uncle Ben, where are you? I wondered. Also, Scooby Dooby Doo, where are you? Why haven't you come out of the pyramid? Are you okay? Sorry, and I didn't say a word. There was no need. We clicked on the torches, then made our way into the pyramid opening. It seemed much steeper than I remembered. I nearly lost my balance, slowing myself to the tunnel floor. Our lights crisscrossed over the dirt floor, I raised mine to the low ceiling, keeping the height high. I led the way through the curving tunnel, creeping along slowly. I trailed one hand against the wall to steady myself. The wall felt soft and crumbly. 
Sorry, kept on my heels. A bright beam of light paving over the floor in front of my feet. She stopped suddenly as the tunnel curved into a small, empty chamber. How do we know we're going in the right direction? She asked, her voice a quivering whisper. I shrugged, breathing hard. I thought you knew your way, I murmured. I've only been down here with Daddy, she replied, her eyes over my shoulders, keeping the empty chamber. We'll keep going until we find him, I told her, forcing myself to sound braver than I felt. She stepped in front of me, shining the light over the chamber walls. Daddy! She shouted. Daddy, can you hear me? Her voice echoed down the tunnel. Even the echo sounded frightened. We froze in face and listened for a reply. Silence. Come on, I urged. I had below my head to step into the next narrow tunnel. Where did it lead? Were we heading towards Prince Karu's tomb? Is that where we'll find Uncle Ben? Questions, questions. I tried to stop them from coming, but they filled my mind, pestering me, repeating, echoing in my head as we followed the tunnel's curse. Daddy! Daddy! Where are you? Sarah's cries became more frantic as we moved deeper and deeper into the pyramid. The tunnel curved up steeply, then levelled off. Sari suddenly stopped, startled. I bumped into her hard, nearly making her drop her torch. Sorry, I whispered. Gabe, look! She cried, pointing her beam of light just ahead of her trainers. Footprints! I lowered my eyes to the smaller circle of light. I could see a set of footprints in the dirt. A heel and spiky bumps. Work boots, I muttered. She circled the floor with the light. There were several different pints in the dirt, heading in the same direction we were. Does this mean we're going the right way? she asked. Maybe, I replied, studying the prints. It's hard to tell whether these are new or old. Daddy! Sorry, shouted eagerly. Can you hear me? No reply. She frowned and mentioned for me to follow. Seeing the many sets of prints gave us new hope, and we moved faster, trailing our hands along the wall to steady ourselves as we made our way. We both cried out happily when we realised we had reached the outer chambers of our tomb. Our lights played over the ancient hieroglyphs that covered the wall into the doorway. Daddy? Daddy? Sarah's voice cut through the heavy silence. We darted through the empty chamber, then we slept through the opening that led to the tomb. The princess burial chamber stretched out in front of us, dark and silent. Daddy? Daddy? Sarah tried again, and shouted too. Uncle Ben, are you in here? Silence. I swept my light over the room's clutter of treasures, over the heavy chest, the stairs, and clay jars piled in the corner. He isn't here, Sarvi choked with a disappointed sob. But where did Dr. Fielding bring Uncle Ben? I asked. Thinking out loud, there's nowhere else in the pyramid that may have come. Sarah's light came to rest on the large stone mummy case. Her eyes narrowed as she stood at it. Uncle Ben! I shouted... <sighs> Uncle Ben, I shouted frantically. Are you in here somewhere? Sari grabbed my arm. Gabe, look! She cried. Her light remained on the mummy case. I couldn't work out what she was trying to show me. What about it? I demanded. The lid! Sari murmured. I gazed at the lid. The heavy stone slab covered the case tightly. The lid is closed! Sari continued, stepping away from me in the mummy's case. Her light remained on the lid. Yeah, so? I still didn't understand. When we all left this afternoon, Sari explained, the lid was open. In fact, I remember Daddy telling the workers to leave the lid open for tonight. You're right, I cried. Help me, Gabe, Sari pleaded, putting her whole torch down at her feet. We have to open the mummy case. I hesitated for a second, feeling a wave of cold fear run down my body. I took a deep breath and moved to help Sari. She was already pushing the stone lid with both hands. I stepped up beside her and pushed, too, pushed with all my might. The stone slab slid more easily than I guessed. Working together, Sari and I strained against the lid, pushing, pushing. We moved it about a foot. Then we both lowered our heads to peer into the mummy case and gasped in horror. <gasps> Chapter 20 Daddy! Sarah shrieked. Uncle Ben lay on his back, knees raised. Hands at his sides, his eyes shut. Oh, now I can't read the book. Fine. Sorry, and I shoved the heavy stone lid open another foot. Is he? Is he? Sorry, stammered. I pressed my hand on his chest. 
His heart was thumping with a steady beat. He's breathing, I told her. I leaned into the mummy case. Uncle Ben, can you hear me? Uncle Ben. He didn't move. I lifted his hand and squeezed it. It felt warm, but limp. Uncle Ben, wake up, I shouted. His eyes didn't open. I lowered the hand back to the bottom of the mummy case. He's out cold, I murmured. Sarah stood behind me, both hands pressed against her cheeks. Not those cheeks. Get your head out of go me. She stared down at Uncle Ben, her eyes wide with fear. I, I don't believe it. She turned into Victor Melvin. I don't believe it, she cried in tiny voices. Dr. Fielding left Daddy here to suffocate. If he hadn't come along, her voice trailed off. Uncle Ben let out a low groan. Oh. Sarah and I stared at him, hopefully, but he didn't have to open his eyes. We have to call the police, I told Sarah. We have to tell them about Dr. Fielding. But we can't just leave Daddy here, Sarah replied. I started to reply, but a frightening thought burst into my mind. I felt a shudder of fear roll down my body. Sorry? <laughs> Maybe no one is looking. Hey, hello, Wolf. You're right, but. Uh, Sorry, I started. If Uncle Ben is lying in a mummy case, then where is the mummy? Her mouth dropped open. She stared back at me in stunned silence. Then we both heard the footsteps. Slow scraping footsteps. And saw the mummy stagger stiffly into the room. <gasps> burp, burp, burp. Terrifying. Chapter 21. Actually, I'm going to have a quick sip. <laughs> My throat's quite dry. Turns out reading the entire book uh, makes your throat dry. Maybe talking about sand and deserts and pyramids is not helping. Maybe that's just psychological. Anywho. Chapter 21. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. I have no mouth and I'm a scream. That's a great game, by the way. The mummy lurched stiffly through the chamber doorway. He stared straight ahead through his vacant, tarry eyes. Under the ancient layers of tar, the skull grinned at us. Scrape. Scrape. His feet dragged over the dirt floor, trailing shreds of decaying gauze. Slowly, he raised his arms, making a terrifying cracking sound. Scrape. Scrape. My throat tightened in terror. My entire body began to tremble. I backed away from the mummy case. Sorry had stood frozen with her hands pressed against her cheeks. I grabbed her arm and pulled her back with me. Sorry, get back, get back, I whispered. She stared in terror at the approaching mummy. I couldn't tell if she heard me or not. I tugged her back further. Our backs hit the chamber wall. The mummy scraped closer. Closer. Staring at us through its vacant, blackened eye sockets, he reached out for us with his yellow, tar-encrusted hands. Sorry, let out a shrill shriek. Eee! Run! I screamed. Sorry! Run! But our backs were pressed against the wall. The mummy blocked our path to the doorway. Moving stiffly, awkwardly, the ancient corpse dragged itself closer. This is all my fault, I declared in a trembling voice. I said the words five times. I brought him back to life. W what can we do? Sorry cried in a hushed whisper. I didn't have an answer. Uncle Ben! I shrieked desperately. Uncle Ben! Help us! Fight off this ancient evil. On your own. You'll be fine. But the mummy case remained silent. Even my frantic screams could not awaken my uncle. Sorry and I edged along the chamber wall. Our eyes locked on the approaching mummy. Its bandaged feet straight across the floor, sending up dark clouds of dust as it moved heavily towards us. A sour smell rose over the room, the smell of a 4,000-year-old corpse coming to life. I pressed my back against the cold stone of the chamber wall. What, again? How far back into that room are you? Honestly. I pressed my back against the cold stone of the chamber wall, my mind racing. The mummy stopped at the mummy case, turned stiffly, and continued lurching towards us. Hey! I cried out as an idea burst into my mind. My little mummy hand! The summoner! Why hadn't I thought of it before? Could you fig? I figured this out hours ago. It had saved us last summer by raising a group of ancient mummies from the dead. Oh, you've got to go more into detail on that. Could it also summon the dead to stop them? Could it make them die again? If I raised a little mummy hand to stop Prince Karoo, would it stop him long enough for Sari and me to escape? He was only seconds away from grabbing us. It was worth a try. I reached into my back jeans pocket for the mummy hand. It's gone. <sighs> da, da, da. Meanwhile, in chapter 22, 
No! I uttered a surprised cry and frantically grabbed at the other pockets. No mummy hand. Gab, what's wrong? Sally demanded. The mummy's hand. It's gone. I told her. My voice choked with panic. Scrape. Scrape. The foul odour grew stronger as the ancient mummy dragged nearer. I was desperate to find my mummy hand, but I knew there was no time to think about it now. We've got to make a run for it, I told Sari. The mummy is slow and stiff. If we can get past him. But what about Daddy? She cried. We can't leave him here. We have to, I told her. We'll get help. We'll come back for him. The mummy made a brittle crackling sound. As it stepped forward, the sound of an ancient bone breaking. But it continued towards us, moving stiffly but steadily, its arms outstretched. Sorry, run. Now, I screamed. I gave her a little hard shove to gave her going. The room blurred as I forced myself to move. The mummy made another loud crackling sound. It leaned its body forward and reached out as we dodged around it. I tried to duck under the mummy's outstretched hand, but I felt the scrape of its ancient fingers against the back of my neck. Cold fingers, hard as a statue. Who were? I know it was a touch I would never forget. Bad touch, bad touch. My neck tingled. I lowered my head from its grasp and plunged forward. Sorry, let out low sobs as she ran. My heart raced as I hurried to catch her up. I forced myself to run, but my legs felt so heavy, as if they were made of solid stone. We were nearly to the doorway when we saw a flickering light. Sari and I both cried out and skidded to a stop as a beam of light swept into the room. Behind the light, a figure stepped into the doorway. Shielding my eyes from the sudden brightness, I squinted hard, eager to see who it was. Nyla! I cried as she raised the torch beam to the ceiling. Nyla, help us! I choked her. He's come alive! Sari shouted to her. Nyla, he's come alive! She pointed back towards the mummy. Help us! I screamed. Nyla's eyes wide in surprise. What can I do? She asked. And when her expression changed quickly to anger. What can I do about you two kids? You shouldn't be here. We're going to ruin everything. Huh? I cried out in surprise. Nyla stepped into the room. She raised her right hand. In the dim light, I struggled to make out what she was holding up. My little mummy hand. She raised it above the mummy. Come to me, my brother. Nyla called. <laughs> She's evil. Who didn't see that coming? How did you get my mummy hand? Oh, he says in chapter 23. What are you doing? I demanded. Nyla ignored my questions. She held the torch in one hand. She gripped her little hand in the other, holding it towards the approaching mummy. Come here, me brother, she called, waving the hand, summoning the mummy. It is I, Princess Nyla. Its legs cracking, its brittle bones breaking inside the gauze wrapping. The mummy obediently dragged itself forward. Nyla, stop it. What are you doing? Sally shrieked. But Nyla continued to ignore us. It is I, your sister, she cried to the mummy. A triumphant smile crossed her pretty face. Her green eyes sparkled like flashing emeralds in the darting light. I have waited so long for this day, Nyla told her mummy. I have waited so many centuries, my brother, hoping that someday someone would uncover your tomb and we could be reunited. Nyla's face glowed with excitement. The little mummy hand trembled in her hand. I have brought you back to life, my brother, she called to the mummy. I have waited for centuries, but it will be worth it. You and I will share all this treasure, and with our powers, we shall rule Egypt together, as we did 4,000 years ago. She lowered her eyes to me. Thank you, Gabe, she cried. Thank you for the summoner. As soon as I saw it, I knew I had to have it. I knew it could bring my brother back to me. Oh, oh no, I thought that was Gabe talking. Never mind. The ancient words weren't enough. I needed the summoner too. Give it back, I demanded, reaching out for it. It's mine, Nyla. Give it back. A cruel laugh escaped her throat. <laughs> you won't be needing it, Gabe, she said softly. She waved her hand at the mummy. I'm mummy. Destroy them, my brother, she ordered. Destroy them now. There can be no witnesses. No, Sally shrieked. She and I both dived to the doorway, but Nyla moved quickly to block her path. I shoved my shoulder against her, trying to push her away like an American footballer. But... Nyla held her ground with surprising strength. Nyla, let us go, so he demanded, breathing hard. Nyla smiled and shook her head. No witnesses, she murmured. Nyla, we just want to get Daddy out of here. You can do what you want, so he insisted desperately. Nyla ignored her and raised her eyes to the mummy. Destroy them both, she called. 
I cannot leave this tomb alive. Sorry, nice. Go around to see the mummy lumbering towards us. His blackened skull glowed in a dim light. It trailed long strips of glowing low gauze across the dirt floor as it dragged itself closer. Closer. I turned back to the door. Nyla blocked the way. My eyes darted frantically along the chamber. No way to escape. No escape. Then we lurched towards Sari and me, and reached out its cold, cold hands to obey Nyla's cruel command. Chapter 24 Sorry, and I darted towards the door, but Nyla blocked our escape, its vacant eyes gazing blindly at us, its jaw frozen in a hideous skeletal grin. The mummy hurled towards us, raised its arms stiffly, stretched out his hand. Dived at us with a final desperate lurch, and to my shock, reached past Sari and me, and wrapped its tired hands around Nyla's throat. Her mouth opened in a choked cry of protest. The mummy tilted back its head as it gripped her. Its tired eyes moved, and a dry cough cut through the air. <laughs> and then the whispered words, dry as death, escaped the mummy's throat. Let me rest in peace. Nyla uttered a choked cry. The mummy tightened its fear gaze, grip on his throat. I spun around and grabbed its arm. Let her go, I screamed. A dry wreath erupted from the blackened skull. Its hands tightened around Nyla, bending her back, bending her towards the floor. Nyla's eyes shut in defeat. Her hands flew up helplessly. The torch in the mummy hand fell to the floor. I grabbed my little mummy hand and shoved it into my jeans pocket. Let go, let go, let go, let it go, let it go. I shrieked. I leaped onto the mummy's back and tried to pull its hands from Nyla's throat. It let out a defiant roar. roar. A harsh whisper of anger. Then it heaved itself up straight and struggled to toss me off its shoulders. I gasped, startled by the mummy's surprising strength. As I started to slide off the mummy's bandaged back, I reached out my hand, grabbing desperately, grabbing air, trying not to fall. My hand grabbed onto Nyla's amateur pendant. Hey! I cried as the mummy gave me a hard toss. I tumbled off. A pendant tore off its chain. It fell from my hand, crashed to the floor, and shattered. No! Now this horrifying whale shook the walls. The mummy froze. And I just spun out in the mummy's grass. Backed away. Her eyes wide with terror. My life! My life! She shrieked. She bent and struggled to pick up the shards of amber from the floor, but the pendant had shattered into a hundred tiny pieces. My life! Now they wailed, staring into the smooth pieces under her palm. She raised her eyes to Sari and me. I lived inside the pendant, she cried. At night I crept inside. It kept me alive for over 4,000 years. And now, now, oh. As her voice trailed off, Nyla began to shrink. Her head, her arms, her entire body grew tinier, tinier, until she disappeared into her clothes. And a few seconds later, as Sari and I gaped down in horror and shook, a black scarab crawled out from under the sweatshirt and jeans. The scarab moved unsteadily at first, then it quickly scuttled away over the dirt floor, disappearing into the darkness. That, that beetle, Sari stammered. Is that Nyla? I nodded. I suppose so, I said, staring down at Nyla's crumpled clothes. Do you think she really was an ancient Egyptian princess? Prince Karu's sister, she murmured. It's all so weird, I replied. I was thinking hard. We were. That's not the time trying to piece it all together, trying to make sense of what Nyla had said. She must have returned to her scarab form every night, I told Sarah. Thinking out loud, she crawled into the amber and slept inside it. It kept her alive until... Until you smashed the amber pendant, Sari whispered. Yes, I nodded. It was an accident, I started. But I choked on my words as I felt a cold hand close to my shoulder. I knew that the mummy had grabbed me from behind. Yeah, I was about to say, um, this mummy's still around, you know. All right, is this the last chapter? No, there's one more chapter after this. Chapter 25. The hand rested on my shoulder. The cold seeped through my t-shirt. Let go, I screamed. I spun around and my heart skipped a beat. Uncle Ben, I cried. Daddy! Sally let forward and threw her arms around him. Daddy, you're okay. He pulled his hand off my shoulder and rubbed the back of his head. He blinked his eyes uncertainly and shook his head. Still a little dazed. Behind him, I saw the mummy standing hunched over him, frozen, lifeless once again. Ugh, I'm a little groggy, Uncle Ben said, sweeping over hand and back through his thick black hair. That's a close call. It's all my fault, I admitted. 
I repeated the words five times, Uncle Ben. I didn't mean to bring the mummy back to life, but... A smile crossed my uncle's face. He lowered his arm around my shoulders. You didn't do it. Gabe, he said softly. Nyla got there first, he sighed. I didn't believe in the power of the chant, he said softly, but I do now. Nyla stole your mummy hand and chanted the ancient words. She used a summon to bring back the mummy to life. Dr. Fielding and I were both suspicious of her. You were? I cried, surprised. But I thought... I became suspicious of Nyla at dinner, Uncle Bennett explained. Remember? She asked me what were the six ancient words to bring the dead to life. Well, I had never revealed that there were six, so I wondered how Nyla knew there were six words. Ah. Plot thickens. Uncle Ben put an arm around Sarvis' shoulder too and led us to the wall, and they leaned his back against the wall, rubbing the back of his head. That's why I went to the communications tent straight after dinner. Uncle Ben continued. I found the Cairo son. They had never heard of Nyla at the newspaper, so I knew she was a fake. But we saw that Dr. Feeling pull you from the tent, Sari broke in. We saw him force you into the pyramid, and Uncle Ben chuckled. You two are very good spies, he scolded. Dr. Fielding didn't force me to do anything. He had spotted Nyla sneaking into the pyramid, so he found me at the communications tent, and the two of us hurried up to the pyramid to see what Nyla was up to. We got there too late, Uncle Ben continued. She had already brought the mummy to life. Dr. Fielding and I tried to stop her. She hit me over the head with a torch. She dragged me inside the mummy case. I guess she stuffed me inside. He rubbed his head. That's all I remember. Until now. Until I awoke and saw Nyla turn into a scarab. We all saw Dr. Fielding hurry out of the pyramid, Sarah reported. He walked right past me. He had the weirdest look on his face and... She stopped and her mouth dropped open. We all heard the sounds at the same time. Scraping of the feet on the floor outside the burial chamber. My heart jumped to my throat. I grabbed Uncle Ben's arm. The footsteps got closer. More mummies. More mummies brought to life. Staggering towards the prince's tomb. It's the final chapter, guys. Are you ready? Let's brace yourselves for an ending. Let's see how this goes. Chapter 26. I reached into my jeans pocket for my little mummy hand. Pressing my back against the wall. Raised my hands to the chamber doorway. And waited. Waited for the mummies to appear. But to my surprise, Dr. Fielding burst into the room, followed by four dark uniformed police officers, hands on their gun holsters. Ben, are you okay? Dr. Fielding called to my uncle. Where was the young woman? She, she escaped, Uncle Ben told him. How could he explain that you turned into a bug? The police explored the chambers warily. Their eyes came to rest on the mummy, frozen in place near the doorway. I'm so glad you're okay, Ben. Said what Dr. Fielding said, placing a hand warmly on Uncle Ben's shoulder. Then he turned to Sari. I'm afraid I owe you an apology, Sari, he said, frowning. When I ran out of here, I must have been in a shock. I remember sitting outside the pyramid, but I don't remember saying anything to you. That's okay, Sari replied, quietly. I'm really sorry for frightened you, Dr. Fielding told her. Your dad had been knocked unconscious by that crazy young woman, and all I could think about was calling the police as fast as possible. Well, the excitement is over, Uncle Ben said, smiling. Let's all get out of here. We started towards the doorway, but a police officer interrupted. Could I just ask you one question, he asked, staring at your right mummy in the centre of the floor. Did that mummy walk? No, of course not. You strutted. Uncle Ben replied quickly, a grin spreading over his face. If it could walk, why would it be doing in this dump? Well, once again, it turned out to be the hero of the day. And of course, later in the tent, I wasted no time in bragging about my courage to Sari. Sari had no choice. She had to sit there and take it. After all, I was the one who stopped the mummy and turned Nyla back into a beetle by smashing her pendant. At least you're not too conceited, Sari shot back, rolling her eyes. Lame. Really lame. Well, that scarab crawled away and disappeared, she said. An evil smile crossed Sari's lips. I bet that bug is waiting for you, Gabe. I bet it's waiting for you in your camp bed. Waiting to bite you. I laughed. Sorry. You say anything to try and scare me. You just can't find the idea that I'm the hero. You're right, she replied dryly. I can't stand the idea. Good night, Gabe. A few moments later, I was in my pyjamas and ready for bed. What a night. What an amazing night. As I slid into the bed and pulled over the covers, I knew it was nights I would never forget. Ouch! And that's it. 
That's how it ends. The word ouch. Which suggests he just got bitten by a scarab. And he's going to die. What a happy ending. Well, that was Return of the Mummy by R. L. Stein. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that was probably one of the better ones I've read, I've read on this channel. It's way better than Welcome to Camp Nightmare. That was garbage. That had a terrible ending. And yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, that was alright. It actually had a sort of twist and an actual evil to them rather than, oh, it's some bullshit. But yeah, that was alright. Okay. Uh, well, I guess that is it for the evening. With a, a stream over and done with. I will not be back tomorrow because I'm off for a booster shot. So I will not be around. But this video will be going on YouTube. So you can watch it at your leisure. And I will post it on the Discord. Uh, speaking of, very, very quickly, let's just pop that down. And we shall end for the evening. Excellente. There we go. There's a Discord link. Happy days. Right. I'm going to go now because uh, I'm quite tired from reading all that. <laughs> Whole book in one go. Again. I'm such a mad lad. Thank you ever so much for sticking by. I hope you enjoyed that live reading. And I will catch you probably Saturday. Saturday I'll be back with the Bulbasaur Challenge. And I'll be doing Resident Evil in the evening. Resident Evil 3. Original Resident Evil 3. So that'll be good. But I'm off. Catch you later, my man. And I'll catch you when I catch you next. Teddy buys. Bye and bye. Bye. Bye.